Secret Society of Black Scientists and Engineers, in conjunction with Visions, the Afro-American Studies Department, and the Black Community Services Center, is proud to present to you tonight Dr. Asa Hilliard, Dean of the School of Education at San Francisco State University, addressing the topic of African and Afro-American history and mental freedom. Before Dr. Hilliard's presentation, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Irving Brown, Professor of Psychology at Stanford University. Peace and love to all mankind. That begins with self, you know. Doesn't end there, it begins there. Self-love incidentally begins with self-knowledge. And that's what uh, the brother I plan to introduce start dealing, there are several ways. this afternoon, this evening. Dr. Asa Hilliard, uh, in fact, it's, it's a great pleasure and in fact an honor <coughs> to introduce this brother to you, a brother who, in my opinion, has contributed more than his share to what I see, what many of us see as the most central, what in fact is the most central task facing African people at this point in history. Indeed, the central task since our colonization and removal from the motherland, Africa. And that task is the liberation of the black mind. The liberation of the black mind from a continued <clears throat> slave mentality, if you will. A continued, <clears throat> excuse me, a continued mentality of dependence. A mentality that we as a people we as black people cannot do for self, cannot build for self, cannot build institutions for self, economic institutions, educational institutions, build in the area of commerce for self. All of these things reflect all of our great spiritual leaders have called in one form or another, in one term or another, a mentality of dependence. That I see as a number one task facing African people. Now, there's a lot of concern in America these days about the topic of mind control. Okay, but just reflecting on the few things I've mentioned already, you should realize that mind control is nothing new to the African American that we didn't develop this mentality of dependence. And this is not to say that all of us are characterized by this thing I call slave mentality. Most of us fall prey to it at some time or another. And that we vary a great deal amongst ourselves in this regard. But that we didn't get this way by accident. We didn't reach a point by accident where we believe that we cannot do and cannot build for self. This is something that's rooted in slavery and has continued in an unbroken fashion since slavery. It didn't just happen in slavery and end there. It has continued since slavery. I was asked, um, the person who asked me to introduce Brother Asa, to say a couple of words, a few words that might put the topic we're dealing with tonight in, a, in some kind of psychological perspective. And my response was that Asa will put it in sufficient psychological perspective. But I would like to say a couple of things about slave mentality and a couple of things about psychology. Because as I see it, uh, I mean, I am a psychologist by profession and by training. But as I see it, uh, some of the greatest psychologists that ever lived are people like Frederick Douglass, people like Carter G. Woodson, people like Elijah Muhammad, people like Malcolm X. So what I want to do very briefly, and all of these men who've been leaders of African-American people have in some form or fashion dealt with the topic of slave mentality. And what I'd like to do is just briefly point out some parallels between their thinking and what we generally in the university 
consider to be psychology. Because ultimately, or at least in the context of my few words, we want to get a sense of where this thing that I call, I so boldly call slave mentality came from. Back during slavery days, and that wasn't as long ago as a lot of us think as we're led to believe, it was very important to control the slaves, not just through physical brutality, but through other means. Let me share very quickly some of Frederick Douglass's wisdom, some of Frederick Douglass's psychology on this matter. Frederick Douglass tells us, to enslave men successfully and safely, it is necessary to keep their minds occupied with thoughts and aspirations short of that of which they are deprived. A certain degree of attainable good must be kept before them. I'm thinking, I'm reminded of probably the simplest kind of model or paradigm or method or procedure, if you will, in psychology, namely the, Skin the Skinnerian kind of experiment. All of you are familiar with this from your introductory psychology courses. You put a rat in a box called a Skinner box, and you deprive him of water, food, or what have you, and you, through a certain set of techniques, can get the animal to press a bar, a lever, a pigeon to peck a disc, in order to receive food or water, once the animal has been deprived. Now, as I read the writings of men like Frederick Douglass, I found out, find out very quickly that Skinner only formalized these techniques, that techniques of reward, systematic use of reward and punishment and deprivation has existed in this country from quite, for quite some time. That during the early 70s, the late 60s, when there was a big uproar about B.F. Skinner and his conditioning techniques, and especially when he wrote a book called Beyond Freedom and Dignity, in which he talked about, the, in which he talked about the issue of controlling human behavior systematically, a lot of people became upset. A lot of people became concerned about being, us being put in some big Skinner box with Big Brother somewhere administering the rewards and punishment contingent upon good behavior as defined by him. But a number of black psychologists pointed out at that time that black people have always been in a big Skinner box. That that's nothing new, no reason to get upset at that if we hadn't been upset before, that that had been the situation. But the psychology gets a bit more complex than the simple Skinnerian kind of design. When you start talking about not only controlling behavior but really getting into the business of controlling people's minds. So let me read on through Douglas's quote, because the psychology is a bit more complicated than the rat in the Skinner box. Frederick Douglass is talking about holidays in this particular example that I'm reading from. A certain degree of attainable, attainable good must be kept before them. Holidays serve the purpose of keeping the minds of the slaves occupied with prospective pleasure within the limits of slavery, that is, within the Skinner box if you will. The young man could go wooing, the married man could see his wife, the father and mother to see their children, the industrious and money-loving could make a few dollars, and we got that happening today, the great wrestler could win laurels, the young people meet and enjoy each other's society, the drinking man could get plenty of whiskey, and the religious man could hold prayer meetings, preach, pray, and exhort. Before the holidays there were pleasures in prospect after the holidays, there were pleasures of the memory, and they served to keep out thoughts and wishes of a more dangerous character. If you don't see the relationship between that and things that have happened since slavery and possibly, and, and also today, then we should take another look. Douglas also understood what you call the psychodynamics of behavior. For those of you who aren't familiar with that kind of theory, let this be your first quick mini lesson and you might want to pursue it further. Douglas said that holidays, for example, also serve the purpose of providing an escape valve, that so much pressure would build up if you kept a man working continuously and not give him some kind of break that it would be impossible to keep him enslaved, he would rebel. So even the principles that we commonly think of as psychodynamic, 
for example, Freudian and various other forms of psychology, were used during slavery, not explicitly, not that these things had been formulated, but that they were exemplified in the behavior of the slave master and the slave system. And that men, perceptive black men like Frederick Douglass, penetrated and understood that psychology and passed it down to us. Unfortunately, we don't get to read Frederick Douglass in college, not his own writings at least, not the primary sources. After slavery, even more sophisticated techniques had to, had to be used to control the black masses. Black labor was needed after slavery, just like during slavery. So some way, some means had to be devised of being able to exploit this labor pool, but at the same time, or realizing that it could not be done with slave master's whip. And um, the technique that was eventually used was called education. Carter Woodson called it miseducation. A quote from another great black psychologist, the year is about 1933. Education. No systematic effort toward change, and I'm not one who knocks education. We're just talking about miseducation quickly. No systematic effort toward change has been possible for taught the same economics, history, philosophy, literature, and religion, which has established the present code of morals, the Negro's mind has been brought under the control of his oppressor. The problem of holding the Negro down, therefore, is easily solved. When you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him not to stand here or go yonder. He will find his, quote, proper place and will stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he will cut one for his own special benefit. His education makes it necessary. That's psychology. When you read and study psychology in your textbooks, attempt to relate it to some of these realities that take place in our history and also our contemporary experiences. Later, Elijah Muhammad told us in the 40s, 50s, and 60s that if you, can, if you know the range of a man's thinking, the diameter of a man's thinking, you can predict and control the circumference of his behavior. That's psychology. Malcolm X later told us, Malcolm was objecting to sit-ins. He, he never went to, cared too much for the sit-ins that took place in the South. And uh, he was talking about the need to change your attitude. And Malcolm said, if you change your attitude, you change your thought patterns. And if you change your thought patterns, you change your behavior patterns. And as long as you've got that old sit down attitude, they'll have you sitting in everywhere. And he went on. But the point once again is if you control or if you change, if we're talking about reflecting on ourselves, our way of thinking, then we'll change our way of behaving. So then to be able to control the educational input is a very critical, if not the most critical, area of being able to control black people. Now, that's the topic that, or should I say this is the tra tradition that I see Brother Asa Hilliard as following in. It's a tradition of men like Frederick Douglass and he'd probably be too modest to say this himself. Carter G. Woodson, you know, great black psychologist, who had at their task the freeing of the black mind from a mentality of dependence. So, it's again with a great deal of pleasure and honor that I introduce Dr. Hilliard to you. I'll say a few words briefly about his background. Asa received his doctorate at the University of Denver and has made a number of contributions to what we, t we think of as pro professional or mainstream journals. He's 
received a number of awards, a list that's actually too long to even go into. And I'm sure he'll impress you sufficiently tonight. Uh, in fact, to, to, to such an extent that you'll probably forget the list. One of, one of these titles that really sort of, sort of threw me here that the brother has. I didn't, I didn't, know, any, I didn't know any black people had these kind of titles. Um, in, um, in Liberia, conferred upon him the title. The president uh, decorated him with uh, the title of Knight Commander of the Human Order of African Redemption. <laughs> okay, you laugh. I mean, it's, it's a heavy title, sounds heavy, but, but check it out, of African Redemption. That's what the brother's about. I think that was a very appropriate title. Ace has done a number of studies, a number of papers dealing with the topic of culture, the topic of cultural pluralism, and having read quite a few of these papers, I can assure you that in a time of confusion, in a time where it's very difficult to find something meaningful in the, the plethora of books and papers that, that we find around us these days, that Asa brings a refreshing degree of clarity and elegance and simplicity to uh, issues related to culture fairness and testing and a host of other issues that are immediate concern to black people. So, with this in mind, I'd like to bring to you and leave you with one final word. <laughs> yes, let me leave you with one final word, okay? Because Brother Ace is gonna talk to you about your past and you will see beyond a shadow of a doubt that your well of culture, history, and wisdom runs very deep. That will be proved beyond a shadow of a doubt. But it will remain as your own task, your task, your task, to tap that well in yourself if we are to begin to reconstruct these great civilizations that we had in the past. So let me just say, whenever you have the opportunity, in fact, take the opportunity, to drink from your own spring, at least you lose your roots. With that last word, I'd like to bring on our speaker for tonight, <laughs> Brother Asa Hilliard. I really want to thank uh, Irving is one of the people that I deeply respect and depend upon for stimulation and ideas and his leadership. Um, <clears throat> I'm very happy to be here this evening and to have a chance to do the slide presentation. I understand that a uh, few of you have seen this before. I can't guarantee you that uh, it will be done the same way. The slides are probably the same as the ones you saw before, but I think of different things each time that we do this. I uh, saw an Ebony article in the last issue of Ebony comparing Bo Derrick and Cecily Tyson. And uh, Bo Derrick, as you know, is uh, quite famous for her braids, an African hairdo. But when it becomes braids, then of course it lost its origin and its meaning. And so some people were angry with Bo Derrick uh, for copying the African tradition. Uh, but that's, of course, not the first time that the African tradition has been copied. Uh, some were angry with Bo Derrick because, uh, especially black Women were angry who themselves considered um, African tradition meaningful and substantive and who themselves maybe even wore the corn, corn rose or so forth. Others who didn't wear it were angry with Bo Derrick <laughs> and who didn't even know it was African until Bo, Der <laughs> until Bo Derrick was criticized. And so Bo Derrick beat some of us to the recognition of African tradition. It's always been that way. And um, I've wondered though why it was that way because I'm not particularly angry with Bo Derrick. She sees a good thing and, and copies it. 
she follows in the tradition of many, many people who have seen good things about African people and copied it. My problem is why we don't copy ourselves more. Um, it's been 400 years or so that black people have been in America. And one writer in San Diego says that those have been 400 years without a comb. And he's a barber. And you think about it for a minute, and you will realize that we actually did spend 400 years in America with hair like ours and nothing to comb it with. It wasn't until the late 60s and early 70s that we realized that combs could be made to comb our hair. Uh, the continent was full of combs. The continent that we left, uh, they had decorative combs. Some of those combs now sell for two and three hundred thousand dollars because they're pieces of art. And so the brothers and sisters on the continent were just combing away, <laughs> grooming their hair. But something as simple as how to get your hair groomed, something as simple as that in our thinking had been lost. And even after the combs were rediscovered, uh, it's the Koreans who make natural combs <laughs> and ship them to us. And again, I can't blame the Koreans for seeing a good thing and taking advantage of it. Uh, those who allow themselves to be taken advantage of deserve the treatment that they get. But it's not necessary to be taken advantage of. So I'm happy to be here. Uh, they tell me that this is uh, one of the substations for the Nobel Sperm Bank. <laughs> I often wondered what Nobel scholars did in their spare time. <laughs> and I know they better watch it because they say that if you keep doing that, it could be a habit. <laughs> and if you don't stop doing it, it can make you crazy. <laughs> if you're not already crazy. <laughs> um, but it's nice to be near where that happens. <laughs> uh, it's also nice to be in Terman Hall. Right. And um, I'm very happy to be in uh, Terman Hall because um, in Terman Hall they have some things that are, are very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> Terman is the intellectual grandson of uh, Spencer, who was a man who thought up social Darwinism, you know, the survival of the fittest socially. And uh, his other grandfather was um, Galton, who thought up the idea that some people ought not have babies, mainly white people, and others should have a lot of babies in order to purify the race. Good genes or eugenics or you could have uh, bad genes. And uh, those men influenced a man named G. Stanley Hall, who was Terman's teacher, where he got his doctorate. And so the man for whom this building is named on this fine campus uh, was Louis Terman, who uh, said that blacks and Chicanos and Indians were people whose dullness seemed to be racial or at least inherent in the family stocks from which they come, and that no amount of education would ever make them intelligent voters or capable citizens. So it's, uh, it's something to think about, especially against what I want to show you, because uh, you would wonder why a man who, for America, represents all the thinking that there is about genius uh, did not seem to be very well informed about history. And if he had been very well informed about history, it would have been hard for him to make some of the statements that he did about genius. And so a part of what I'd like to get to now is the topic of mental freedom. Uh, yes, this is a, a, a slide presentation that uses history, it uses African history, and it uses African-American 
or better still, Afro-diasporan history. But it uses that history not so much to tell the historical story. All of those things are interesting and good, but it's to do what Irving was talking about earlier. It's to provide the information that will allow us to be immune to the certain attempts that there have been and will continue to be to control, enslave the minds of black people so that the behavior, as good uh, Carter Woodson has said, will surely follow. So what I have to show you is not a Ripley's, black Ripley's, believe it or not. <laughs> um, in no way am I attempting to simply resurrect uh, isolated tidbits of information to tickle the fancy of those who choose to be entertained. This is serious business. It is reconstruction. And I'm very proud to be associated as an interpreter of a long tradition of black scholars who have labored to produce the kind of information that I can share with you tonight, and who have done that frequently all by themselves without even a stroke from their colleagues. You don't know how rare it is to have brothers introduce each other <laughs> in the past. You know, to have someone say the good things about me the way Irving did and not let ego get in the way. It's frequently the fact that many of the people who I will show to you this evening are people who were working for us but had to work by themselves. And many of these men actually died without ever seeing any of their work in print. And many of these men not only died not having seen their work in print, but some uh, never got a chance to talk to the family about what they have found. If they got a chance to talk to anyone, it had to be people who could afford them or who were interested, and both of those things obtained. So when you hear me talk about John Jackson, for example, whose book cover I will show, one of the things that he told me was that at the age of 80, he was very pleased in Chicago to have an audience of 40 people because in all the years of his life of researching on black history, even black people were not interested in what he had to say. And uh, that the whites who were interested were either atheists or communists, and that was the limited audience that he had uh, to talk with, and only some of them were interested. So it pleases me that if at some point I can be of help in uh, interpreting the work of these men and in illustrating our problem in education and indeed our problem in survival, then I'm very happy. You have all kinds of fancy equipment here and this happens to be a pointer. <laughs> I come from the poverty section of the bay and so I'm not used to all the fancy equipment and so it, it'll take me a minute to find all these buttons and things like that. And then this is a little pointer here, and I usually have to use my finger. But I'm going to take advantage of all of this this evening. <laughs> um, let me see if it works. I tried it, but... <laughs> here it is. <laughs> Maybe Terman wasn't all wrong. <laughs> Ai Kwe Ama wrote a book, some of you probably know, The Beautiful Ones Are Not Yet Born. I hope you know this one, 2,000 Seasons, and it refers to the 2,000 seasons or 2,000 years approximately that African people have been dominated by people from the outside. Europeans were the on only the last of a whole group of people who dominated Africa. They were not the first. There were others who had come in and taken control of part of the continent. But no matter who the conqueror was, the conquering process was the same. And so this is a novel, it's a story, a very powerful story that tells some of the things that Irving was talking about, about mental slavery, and I'm not gonna go into that, but I hope that if you wanna get a complete sense of what I'm trying to say, you will read uh, Armagh's 2000 Seasons. Again, to reemphasize what Irving was talking about, Steve Biko, 
was one of many Africans who were killed, and he was killed in South Africa. His only crime was that he was trying to enlighten his people. He hit no one, stole nothing, killed no one. He simply wrote information that would help South African blacks to understand their condition. And once they understand the condition, you can be darn well sure that it will destabilize South Africa. And of course, that's why he was killed. So understanding the condition of black people is as important as understanding and enjoying the history of black people. So my request to you is to free your mind, to take charge of your own thoughts, to feel that you can be an independent investigator and return to the source, which means return to primary data, give up all the interpretations, look at them and see what they have to say, but then go look for yourself. And you will find the African origin of civilization, which is a bold statement since some of the great historians of the world have said that we had no civilization. That black people were the only people on the face of the earth who never created a civilization. Those were the words of Arnold Toynbee in his early days. It continues to amaze you how scholars can step over the information that I'm going to show you and still conclude that black people had no part in history. But what you have to know is that during the colonial period in Europe, it was very important that people believed in Europe that black people had no part in history so that missionaries would feel that they were rescuing the pagans, so that politicians could feel that they were rescuing the savages, so that educators could believe that they were teaching the ignorant. But the Africans originated civilization. So as I go through this presentation, which is in four parts, I'd like for you to imagine a flower, a flower that is growing in East Africa, a flower that grows and breaks open, and as it breaks open, the seeds float all over the world. And that will describe what has happened to African people all over the world. And if you can imagine that, and if you can imagine that that was the first flower, there were no flowers recorded yet. In other words, we have found no other place where flowers exist prior to the time that they're discovered on the African continent. So that's the flowering of African people that spread itself all over the world. If you know that, you won't be surprised to discover that there are probably more Africans in Brazil than there are Africans in America. Because you think of Brazil as a country without Africans, because we've been taught in a way that allows us not to get the image of what Brazil is. You've already had Carter Woodson's 1933 book, Miseducation, it's a must for black people. You've already heard that everything that is presented is not necessarily true. And in that, you would agree with Daniel Shore and others who have looked systematically at the information that everyone is fed, not simply black people. You've already heard Irving talk about mind control, and you ought to be aware of the fact that there are people who spend their lives figuring out ways to make you do what you don't intend to do. You can find as many more books as you wish. I'm simply trying to call your attention to the fact that we have such mind control. Four parts for the presentation. Africa in the beginning, Africans crossing the continent and going to other places, especially Europe, Africans in America before Columbus, and Africans, and not only before Columbus, but before Christ, and Africans in America after that. The reason that we don't know these things is that America has been in the process since it grew during colonial times, European colonial times. It was necessary for scholars to forget everything that they had known, and I'm going to demonstrate that to you. I don't think you ought to believe me any more than you believe anyone else unless you can get it firsthand. So what I'm saying to you is we will demonstrate that scholars knew that something else was true about black people. 
and deliberately and calculatedly in some ways erase the history that they knew in order to produce dependent people. And that process still goes on in some of the finest institutions. Racism was not born in the streets. It was born in the university with people like de Gabonneau in France and others. What had to happen was you had to produce a primitive. And so I'm going to show you the production of the primitive. That means mentally black and white people had to believe that there was something called primitive. And there still is that belief that you can go around the world and find people who are primitive. Now, if you mean by primitive what I mean by primitive, that's not bad because it simply means first. But if you mean by primitive lower or depraved or deprived, then, of course, you're joining the old tradition, which was created to prove that black people were not even human, couldn't sing, couldn't think, couldn't count, and so forth. So we produced the primitive in the universities with publications coming out of the universities like this, Encyclopedia Britannica, 1910, second paragraph, mentally the Negro is inferior to the white. This is what we teach in schools. We produce the primitive with the greatest scholars known to France and Germany and England. So when Andy Young spoke and said racism was invented in Europe, he said England, it was really invented in other parts of Europe as well, he was right. And it's documented. You don't have to go anywhere except to read the books that were written at that time. You can read the statements of presidents. This happens to be the title of a book, Our Racist President. And the reason that they can say that and not have it simply be polemical or rhetorical is that they present for you in the president's own words their belief about the inferiority of non-white people. You can look at the invention of the primitive in law, and Derrick Bell at Harvard University has documented that, as has Judge Higginbottom documented the presence of racism and the creation of the primitive in law. The invention of the primitive was in all departments of the university. This happened to have been in Hitler's Germany. And this is a very important book that I recommend to you if you want to understand how racist thoughts can infiltrate the highest minds in academe. You will study Hitler's professors, the role of scholarship in Germany's crimes against the Jewish people. For example, biology departments that invent Jewish genes, history departments that invent no history for people, and uh, geography departments that put white people in South Africa before <laughs> black people got there language departments that says we were babbling and not talking. This is what I mean by the use of the university to create the primitive. Guthrie. <laughs> A black psychologist in San Diego, used to be with the Office of Naval Research, produce this book, which is the history of the field of psychology. Try it on any field. Some of you are looking for theses to do. Do your thesis on the history of your field, and you will find the same thing that Guthrie found. Even the rat was white. And if these views don't frighten you, they should. And so you should read books like Who Should Play God, and you'll find that the social Darwinists are still alive, debating now who will be cloned. Who will be able to have a license to have babies in order to improve the good stock and to weed out the poor stock? If you have an enslaved mind, you'll cooperate in your own enslavement. The primitive was invented in theater, innocent and entertaining. The primitive was invented with minstrels, white people imitating black people who were imitating white people. And white people got so good with their imitations that black people began to imitate white people who were imitating black people who were imitating white people. <laughs> the man who stars in Roots runs around the country making uh, presentations and receiving standing ovations for imitating Burt Williams. There are a lot of white people who still love to see black people play menstrual parts. 
Why is that necessary? What need does that serve? If you're a psychologist, it would seem that you might want to do a thesis on that. The need for minstrels among some white people. Okay. Artists help to create the primitive. The images of black people drawn mostly by white people, the use of Hollywood to create the images that would be satisfying has been documented and is still in operation. I hope you join the protests against the filming of Charlie Chan. In all the years that Charlie Chan has been a movie, and with all the millions of Chinese that exist, not one has been able to play the Chinese part of Charlie Chan because that image had to be controlled by whites, not by Chinese. That's dependence, not independence. So Hollywood has had a very good part in inventing the primitive. For black people, the primitive was uh, Step and Fetch It, who was such a good actor that people got a Jones for Step and Fetch It, hooked on Step and Fetch It. And so it's almost impossible to have a black drama today unless the Step and Fetch It part is played by someone. You name me a TV sitcom that doesn't have a Step and Fetch It on it. Name me a TV movie that's popular that doesn't have a Step and Fetch It in it. Where are the psychologists who will study America's need for Step and Fetch It? The use of step and fetch it as a foil for the image of a strong white male is well documented. And the use of other black actors always place the image of a weak black male against the image of a strong white male. Not once, not twice, but always. And you can go on and on and on. And these are old, but the principle is the same. If black people can't do the job, then you can have nigger makeup so white people can do the job. And so if there aren't enough step and fetches who can act it well, then you get white actors who act the part of step and fetch it, as in this scene from a movie where the white actor is using burnt cork to play the part in the creation of the primitive. or the theft of culture is a part of the creation of the primitive. Even those things which black people have invented, such as corn roll, and such as our humor, such as our music, and so forth, are not long black. It won't be long before John Travolta will be the best dancer and the Bee Gees will be the best rhythm and blues group. Black talent had to be funny. Above all, what white America has demanded of black people is that they be funny, meaning clowns, not meaning serious intellectual humor, meaning clowns. So sing behind watermelon and teach both white and black America to learn while they're laughing at black people clowning at Fred Sanford twice a day. At the Jeffersons, the clown with a shirt and a tie. At JJ, these are the images for black children. These are the images for the white personnel director who will go to his suburban home and greet the first black applicant he sees on Monday morning with, can you say dynamite before the interview begins? Flip Wilson in drag. Bill Cosby, as a child, he's Fat Albert. He's the little boy on the block, not serious. As a matter of fact, if you really do want to say something that you want to sneak in that might be serious about black, such as black history, in a movie, black history, lost, stolen, and strayed, then you get not a serious person to narrate the film, you get a comedian, Bill Cosby, to narrate the film. And he's got to be funny while he narrates a serious film about black people. If you can play basketball, you're supposed to laugh. 
One of the things that they said about Kareem that made him most unac unacceptable, even more unacceptable than changing his name, was the fact that he didn't smile enough. And one of the things that makes people most happy about Kareem now is that he has begun to smile more. And you'll see that in most of the pictures of Kareem Jabbar, if, they, if it's possible to catch him at all, he's caught smiling. He's had a change of heart. And it catches for little black children by the millions. So their heroes, J.J. and Fred Sanford, those are our celebrities. Frederick Douglass, there are no Frederick Douglass dolls being sold at Toys R Us. There are no Marcus Garvey dolls. There are no Malcolm dolls. Hand-picked heroes, J.J. and Fred Sanford. Or occasionally you can escape on a holiday, as Irving has told us. You can imagine yourself in the whiz, but at the end of the movie, the thing that you imagine you will find is ephemeral as you walk behind the facade and discover that the whiz is a phony. And you can have him for a little while, Richard Pryor, until it's really discovered what Richard Pryor did and can do. He's a little too intellectual, a little too smart, and the humor is a little bit too true. So Richard Pryor cannot finish a series of six. Politicians helped create the primitive. They did it with their advertisement. After the slaves were freed, this is what they said would happen if Abraham Lincoln was elected. Or this, big black buck laid back, poor white male chopping wood to support big black buck. Look at the opinion polls on why Proposition 13 passed. You'll get the same psychology and mentality. All black people want is welfare. We don't want to, if you're going to cut something, cut social services. And of course, that's what was cut. Newspapers, 1915 Atlanta Constitution, advertisement for birth of a nation, a film from the book that was named The Klansman. The Klansman was a book that glorified the Ku Klux Klan. This film, Birth of a Nation, was shown all over America, still is shown as simply art. It's supposed to be one of the best film that was ever made. It was so good that in 1978, it won an, a national award as one of the best films of all time. Read the content. We have never given up. And in 1915, on the opposite page, in case you missed it in the movie, you could join it in person, advertisement for membership in the Ku Klux Klan in the Atlanta Constitution. The extent of Klan influence on American politics is shown in the 20s. How many states had governors and senators elected and centers of violence, including California, which had both centers of violence and had governors elected with Klan help? And of course, these were not simply theoretical matters. These are not simply historical matters. This is 1978, 1979, 1980. In 1979, or 78, there was an article that appeared in the Chronicle of Higher Education. That's a newspaper that all the presidents and deans get in America. And this article said there's a secret group of people in South Africa called the Brotherhood, or the Broderbond. These are the super Afrikaners. These are young men who for the last 12 years have met in secret and who have designed the curriculum for the South Africans' schools for both whites and blacks. Most people don't know that there can be secret groups of people who determine what other people think and who calculate to design miseducation. And even people who benefit from racism and oppression may sometimes fail to realize that the calculation is in the direction of their own education as well. Racism then is a mental illness 
some black psychologists and some historians and some politicians prefer something different than that. But I say it's a mental illness because it affects the thinking of people in the following ways. It has the same symptoms that cause people to be put in a psychiatrist's office. The symptom of perceptual distortion, which is looking at something and seeing it foggily or distorted way. Denial of reality is looking at something that is really real and then having the gall to say that it's not there. Delusions of grandeur is believing in the supremacy of one's own group over another. Projection of blame means blaming the victim. Phobia for differences means fear of anyone that is different. Those are mental illness symptoms. If there is a person who has any one of those, that person becomes a candidate for therapy, possibly incarceration. What happens when a whole nation has all of those? Free your mind, return to the source, the African origin of civilization, Africa mother of Western and other civilizations. No civilization can be documented to be older at this point than the civilization which emerged in the Nile Valley in Africa. That civilization had as its parent civilizations which developed below the Nile Valley, that is to say to the south, because in those days people oriented to the south. Coming from Uganda, coming from Tanzania, coming from Kilimanjaro, which in Kiswahili means mountain of the moon, which is what the Egyptians said represented their ancestral home in their carvings on the monuments, that we came from the source of the Nile River at the foot of the mountain of the moon. You'll find that on the, on the uh, papyrus of Hunifra. That papyrus said Egyptians came from the south, not from the north. In order to get this information right, in other words, where did Egyptians come from and who, they, who were they? It's important that we not read encyclopedia that were written by people who had a conclusion before they had their investigation. It's important that we not read many of the classical textbooks which have already concluded things that have later been disproved. It's important that we go back wherever possible to primary sources and that we keep the information that we get in single order or in time sequence. For example, if you don't know when the Acropolis was built, and if you don't know when the Temple of Luxor was built, you will assume that the Africans who built the Temple of Luxor copied the Greeks who built the Acropolis because the buildings are basically the same. In fact, it was the other way around because the Temple of Luxor is quite a bit older than the Acropolis in Greece and quite a bit larger and better built. You'll keep the comparison of events in context. In other words, you won't take simply one picture of a family member. You'll try to get the whole family and get a family portrait. So we have a couple family portraits for you, especially when it's contended that some of the Egyptians in the beginning were white people, not black people. If they were, they left no records. They left no evidence. And anyone who says that the early Egyptians were white people first must come up with some evidence to that effect. Mostly what people do is assume and assert. Assumptions and assertions are fine for hypothesis making, but not in terms of proof. On the other hand, there is abundant evidence that the people who built the first civilization that is recognized, see there was some before Egypt, pre-dynastic Egypt, were indeed the same people who are there basically. Not the same people who are there in the northeast corner, but the ones who have been there all along. And we intend to show some of that evidence. That you will know what names mean. That you will look very carefully and figure out where did that name come from? Why are the people called Ethiopians. What kind of word is Ethiopian? The Greeks use the word Ethiopian. It's a Greek word, but they're not Greek people. 
And so the word Ethiopian translated from the Greek means black faced people. And that happens to be exactly the group of people that Herodotus, as an eyewitness in Egypt, 500 years before Christ was born, said he saw. Black skin, big noses, big lips, and woolly headed. Eyewitness. The father of history. Now it's interesting, that, of course, that he can be the father of history when he's looking at history and being taught history by people who are older than the Greeks. But if you're ethnocentric, that's no problem. History starts when you learn of it, not when other people learn of it. So names are very important. The continent's name becomes very important. Aokibulan, Tameri, Kush, Tanishi, as the name for the continent of Africa, not Africa. That's late. And if you see Tanishi and don't know that that refers to you, you can't read your own history. Photographs become important. If you allow people to draw pictures of African people, they will draw them in their own image. I intend to show that. What kind of pictures do artists draw if there is no way to prove that what they draw is what they saw? You will see. Who were the Africans? Africans are the primitives, that is to say, the first people. And this is recognized, especially was it recognized beginning around 1836. 1837, 1850, 1880. And when I say recognize, I mean that the things that were being written were being written by European historians. And they were being written frequently as truth. Such historians as Gerald Massey. This is his book, which you will probably have a hard time finding. Book of the Beginnings. Two thick volumes in that two-volume set. Ancient Egypt, Light of the World two thick volumes. Natural Genesis, two thick volumes. Gerald Massey's lectures, all out of print. Because Gerald Massey said things like this, Book of the Beginning, being an attempt to reconstitute and recover the lost origins of myths, types, symbols, religion. With Egypt as the mouthpiece and Africa as the birthplace. In other words, Egypt was not in Gerald Massey's research, the beginning of African civilization. It was only its expression. That's very important. So you can see why in a colonial era, this man's book would have very little interest to anyone. And so they were out of print until 1975. And then only 500 copies were reprinted. Try to find one and test the kind of availability of data that we have. This is the other book by Gerald Massey, Ancient Egypt, Light of the World. I'm doing these few before I show you the actual uh, concrete features. Simply to say that the, the documents are there, the books are there. And we're back to comb. Combs were always in Africa. Africans were combing their hair while we were struggling with fine teeth plastic comb. Breaking it. Believing that Brill cream would do with a little dab. <laughs> so people were there writing all the time. Sheikh Anta Diop wrote The African Origin of Civilization. But that wasn't a popular book. This man had to work so hard that he had to write three separate doctoral theses at the Sorbonne. And it wasn't because he was an affirmative action student. It wasn't because he had special admissions to the Sorbonne. It wasn't because he was on EOP scholarship like the rest of us, you know what I mean? Uh, he didn't have any breaks anywhere. It was because he was too smart for the Sarban. And so they couldn't accept him writing about his own people. And so when he said that you're wrong, that Africa is not a continent that's split into little bitty tribes, although there are tribes, that when you look at what those tribes are doing, you'll find there's one culture that permeates the continent. And so he wrote about the cultural unity, not the cultural difference of Africa. And so he couldn't get his thesis approved. And so he had to write three separate ones. One is this one. He's got another one called Cultural Unity of Black Africa. And uh, the way he finally got his doctorate from the Sorbonne was to bring in black linguists like Obinga, uh, to bring in black historians, to bring in, bring in black people who had studied Egyptology who already had theirs, so that he could fight documentation with documentation. And now he's one of the great scholars, but they haven't left him alone. 
So he's a physicist, chemist, historian, linguist, and he is writing these things. It calls on all these fields in order for him to write this one book. You be proud. One of the things you'll find about black scholars is they put too much information in their book. In other words, they're so anxious to tell it that instead of doing the nice profit-making thing, which is to tell it three words at a time, stretch it out over a career, they tell all that they can possibly tell in the first book because they don't think they're going to get to write another one. Might not get to sell another. So you find plenty of documentation in Diop's book. You won't find that in the Encyclopedia Britannica or in the scholarly textbooks that many other people write. For example, he gives you the physical evidence and not simply his conclusions. That should be important to scholars. Introduction to African civilization. This is the man I told you about who couldn't get audiences. 80 years old. He's willed his library to John Henry Clark. These books were there. Count Valny's book. This is a French writer. A French writer. And you'll notice that this writer was writing in 17, uh, I guess that's 1793. I wanted to put that date down. This becomes very important. Because in 1793, after studying Egypt, he said, there in Egypt, a people who we have now forgotten, discovered while other folk, meaning whites, were still barbarians, based upon their study of the laws of nature, those civil and religious and scientific institutions which still govern the universe. And to think that those people who did all of that are now our slaves simply because of their sable or black skin and frizzle or nappy hair. Now when this book was translated into English in America, that paragraph was left out as a slight editorial change. When Count Valny came to America, he insisted on redictating his book, and that paragraph was reinserted. So it becomes very important to get what Count Valny said. This is what I'm saying to show that the documents have been there. So the question is, if that book was there in 1793, why didn't your high school curriculum show some signs of it? If Gerald Massey wrote Ancient Egypt, Light of the World, Book of the Beginnings, Natural Genesis, why don't your encyclopedias reflect some of that? Why doesn't your BA degree and your doctoral degree reflect some of that? If indeed we are educating people for liberated thought. And there's more. You're going to buy, I hope, the Journal of African Civilization, which is edited by Ivan Van Sertema, who wrote the book, They Came Before Columbus. He's out at uh, Rutgers University, one of the top anthropologists, originally from Guyana. The poor man has to sit down and type out his own manuscripts because we can't cough up $5,000 to help him to get his journal going, even though he has some of the best black scholars and a few white scholars from anywhere in the country who are revealing things that we never knew before. This particular journal tells all about African navigation, the African number system, tells about Africans in astronomy, African boat building, African metallurgy. Where are you going to find that information out? These are the things that we should be about. Africa, three times the size of the United States of America, Big place, long way from Seattle down to San Diego is only one third of the way down the continent. Africa, the first builders of buildings. This is the oldest skyscraper, none older, 40 stories tall. That's about like the Bank of America. That's how tall they were building it. Three football fields long. Two million, two ton blocks to build it. No mud and straw. So if someone said there's mud and straw to build this, then you would ask for some documentation, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you expect to be able to go find a little mud and straw over there? They tell you that again, ask them which pyramid with mud and straw? A two-ton rock, unless it turns from mud into rock, is certainly not mud. So two million of those set up right. Set up right so that down in the middle of this thing you can use it as an astronomical observatory catching the pole star at the height of its orbit. So you got to know where the pole star is going to be first. That means thousands of years of observation of the stars. That means mathematics in order to compute, calculate where the star belongs. 
That means engineering in order to build a 40-story pyramid that still cannot be built, even with the best Japanese engineers in Egypt today. The one they tried to build. Well, you know the Japanese are the best engineers that we have today. But they tried to build a pyramid. They really did one-third the size of this one, and it collapsed. And so the government of Egypt asked them, please tear down your monstrosity. So these savages in Africa, these primitives in Africa, built the world's first buildings. They built them so fine that you could find all kinds of scientific feats demonstrated, such as the disappearance of the shadow at the stroke of noon in the early spring, because the pyramid has a seven degree concave slope on one side. And that's the only thing that will cause the shadow to disappear in an instant is that degree of concavity. These were builders. The social organization and the political organization that it took to get people to work together to do that, who's gonna study that and talk about the primitives? And so George G.M. James, another scholar from Guyana, have you ever wondered why so many of our good scholars seem to come from the West Indies, from places where a whole lot of black people are together? You ever wonder why so many of them seem to come from Bahamas, you know? You ever wondered about that? People who are conscious, you know, ever wondered about that? It's very important. Why so much stuff comes out of the middle of Harlem? Why the Renaissance started there? You know, why the stuff is coming out? Why the Fanon Center is located in Los Angeles? Think about that. And then think about what we're proposing for our education. So a man did think about that. This was Professor James. At University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. It was set up as Arkansas A&M, so they did not intend to have black professors studying Greek scholars. And here's a black classics professor who was educated in England at Columbia University and who read what the Greeks wrote themselves. And so what you find in this book, which was out of circulation almost from the very time it was published in 1954, 20 years it was out of print. And we finally brought it back into print after we found it was sold under the counters, bootleg copy. If you bought this book, you had to buy it in a brown paper bag wrapping. No one knew who the publisher was, you know, and we had to find that. So people were selling it under counters in black bookstores. We resurrected this book, George James's Stolen Legacy. What did he say? He said simply that the Greeks confessed that they were taught by Africans, that Plato confessed that he went to school in Africa, that Aristotle went to school in Africa, and that before them, Pythagoras went to school in Africa because he was recommended by Thales to go to school in Africa, because Thales had been to school in Africa. That's where he got his, quote, four elements that bear his name. He stole those from Africa, the diagram of opposites. And so he saw that Pythagoras was a genius, like Terman said. He said, Thag? <laughs> If you really want to get ahead, you'll go to Egypt. And he did. And they liked Pythagoras in Egypt. And so he came home and he got something named after him. A theorem. A square plus B square equals C square. The Pythagorean theorem. And Aristotle went to Egypt after Alexander the Great, his teacher, conquered Egypt. And Alexander said, what? or Alexander, his student. Alexander said, what can I give to my beautiful teacher, Aristotle? Nothing would serve him more than to have the best books in the world. Now remember, Herodotus was supposed to be the father of history. You know, and we're looking at around 323 AD. Herodotus is about 500. So in 323, when Aris, or, or Alexander conquers Egypt, we find him now collecting books from all over the world. Now how do you get the fatherhood <laughs> of disciplines where disciplines have already been publishing from all over the world? In other words, discover the fragments that were discovered by Aristotle and Alexander, collected in the library of Alexandria, named after Alexander. And those books came from all over the world. In other words, just because Europe wasn't reading and wasn't literate at the time didn't mean other people weren't. 
And so that was discovered and then bore the name. So Aristotle comes out with a lot of books in his name that he could not, he could not possibly have written. Over a thousand books that bear his name. Now he didn't say he wrote them. His students said he wrote them. Plato told the truth. He didn't pass uh, the EAT. That's the Egyptian aptitude test. <laughs> he actually failed the first two times. Two times he was turned down for admission to the institution of higher education. It was only after he got a good recommendation that they saw potential in the boy. Now these aren't things that you have to make up. You go back and read what Greek said. You go back and read Homer. That's the oldest literature you can find in what would later become Europe, and it wasn't even Europe at that time. That's in Greece. And that's the Iliad and the Odyssey. And what's Homer talking about? He's talking about black people in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Ethiopians up at Troy helping get people out of trouble because they got Trojan horses running back and forth and all of that. And here's Memnon up there with a whole troop of Ethiopians. Wonderful Ethiopians, according to Homer, so good that the gods of Greece leave Greece and go home to be with the Ethiopians where they came from. God, dog, that gets to be interesting. Because they said it. I didn't say it. You can read it. You've got money enough to go over and buy that from the Stanford bookstore. Or you can go, if you can't buy it, and check it out of the library. Because they have that one in there. Iliad and the Odyssey, they taught me that in high school. We just didn't know that Ethiopians referred to us. And that's how we lose. So this man is bringing it back, stolen legacy. He said that philosophy that you talk about, the history that you talk about, the religion that you talk about, just like Valny said, all came from African people. You won't find this in encyclopedias. You gotta ask yourself the question. If you can't find what the Greeks said in encyclopedia, you cannot find it in your textbooks in your philosophy courses, Introduction to Philosophy, when you study the history of mathematics and the history of physics, when you study chemistry, which is named for Africa, Kimi, <laughs> for Egypt, which was the old name for Cam or Egypt, or Ham, if you want, which was our side, according to the legend, <laughs> not Shem, which was their side, according to the legend. So if you can't find yourself in what is now being taught, you have to ask yourself, what has higher education come to? because it was together in Egypt. It used to be grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, astronomy, geometry, and music, the seven liberal arts. That was the nature of higher education. When you say you're gonna major in liberal arts, the university doesn't even tell you what that is anymore because it isn't even liberal arts anymore. You didn't take one of them. There were no majors in Egypt. If you took liberal arts, you took all of them because you unbalanced if you specialize in one to the exclusion of others. Later you will specialize. So later we will copy that in Greece and we'll call one of those grammar, rhetoric, and logic. Those are the subjects for the first university in Europe. First university in Europe had a curriculum called the Trivium. That was one of the three seven liberal arts in Africa. The second university in Europe had a curriculum called the Quadrivium, which is arithmetic, astronomy, geometry, and music. That was the content. That came from Africa. So George James, in the book I showed you, said Greeks copied. And they did. And so did Americans copy. Why, when you take out a dollar bill, did the founding fathers of America decide that they needed an African symbol for the dollar bill? That one there. You could take it out and look at it. And you'll find a pyramid. They didn't build any pyramids in England or France <laughs> that I know of. They took some there, or tried to. They took the obelixes there. The founding fathers also studied Africa and admired the architecture of Africa and took some of it if they could move. It couldn't move the pyramid, so they just move obelixes to the Place de Concorde in Paris, to New York Central Park. And so you get your check, save a little money, decide on a vacation. And so for all the years that I was growing up, you weren't anybody unless you went to Paris, baby. And you get to Paris and you do things the Parisians do. And you walk right past Africa in Paris and didn't know it was there. So isn't that an interesting obelisk? <laughs> I understand Napoleon brought it here. Yeah, very interesting. Why did the founding fathers of America decide to pick an African monument 
as the symbol for Washington, D.C., the capital of this nation. When George James says stolen legacy, you can document it if you know which came first. That's why names and dates are important. Now, I don't have to argue with anyone if I just show pictures, do I? The founding fathers couldn't move this one, though. <laughs> but the grandparents of the founding fathers had called this an Ethiopian or a blackface monument. This is the Sphinx. Napoleon thought it was a blackface monument, and his soldiers did too, because you'll notice that it has no nose, and its mouth is mostly destroyed. And so this is the actual picture of the Sphinx. But Napoleon had a soldier, or had some scholars, some professors that went with him. See, Napoleon is a tourist. He recognized there's a lot of knowledge in Africa. That's not like scholars today. Most scholars think that Africa is a developing country. We're going to help it develop, which usually means we're going to get the goodies, the gold, you know, we're going to get the rubber, we're going to get those kind of iron ore. But this was a redeveloping country, see, because it had already been developed before. Napoleon knew that. Scholars before him knew that. It was only the late comers that think that Africa had nothing. People like Toynbee, brilliant men with tunnel vision. Okay. <laughs> Here we are looking at this sphinx then, with its nose and mouth blown away. Now you want to know why have I jumped from East Africa to Haiti? What does Toussaint L'Overture have to do with the sphinx? Well, it just happened that Toussaint L'Overture is the guy that whipped Napoleon's booty. <laughs> 50,000 of Napoleon's troops were beaten by a slave. Toussaint L'Ouverture. And he was having hell over here in the Western Hemisphere. And he's trying to get a piece of America. You know, he wanted a piece of the rock, like England and Spain and all those places wanted. But Toussaint made him change his mind. Darn African. Christophe made him change his mind. Why do black children not know the names of Toussaint and Christophe? Is it that they were not in history? Is it that they were in history but weren't important? You mean the two men who changed the language that America speaks? In other words, you'd be speaking French tonight, and I'd be speaking French tonight if Napoleon had won, because he intended to conquer the rest of it, and he'd done most of that all over the world, one of the most brilliant and intellectual generals the world has ever known. So these men had a connection with the Sphinx, even looked like the Sphinx, by the way, but they had a connection because one of the, the scholars that Napoleon took with him to Africa was afraid that the monument was going to be destroyed and drew this picture, which was left out of one of most of Toynbee's books. But Toynbee's last book included this picture, but not the explanation I'm giving you. Now, the explanation I'm giving you comes from the man who drew the picture, who was an eyewitness. He said, I was sitting there watching them shoot the cannons and rifles at the nose trying to break up the Sphinx because they thought it was a black monument. That's Baron Dinan. Give you his name, his book, Travels in Egypt and Syria. Check it out. I'd believe in eyewitnesses before I believe in somebody else who later comes along and said Napoleon didn't do it. It was the Mamelukes, those savages from Asia. See, he's still inventing a savage. <laughs> there are no savages in the world, never have been. And so since I said even his artist conception shouldn't trick us, then I just took this side view to show you um, the Sphinx from the side view, and I think you'll see it did a good job. But I'd like to have you look carefully, because when George James says stolen legacy, stolen legacy, that people take what's African, like Bo Derek, change the name to something else, and then people forget that it was African. Look closely, if that's the real, who authorized the change? <laughs> You're not far from San Jose. Go down to the Rosicrucian Museum, and you'll see we're teaching that white people were the sphinxes in Africa. Okay? Or you go down to the De Young Museum, and you'll see that we're teaching little children every time they go in, just subtly, without saying anything, that Egypt was a white civilization. 
See, it's unfortunate that we even have to play these games of who did what black and white. But the point I'm trying to make is that someone has to tried to say the opposite and has tried to use that information to tell black people that they never amounted to anything, never could, never will. It's in your genes. <laughs> okay? Stolen legacy. The stolen legacy that began in Africa, which is now being documented. This comes out of the Journal of African Civilization. This is an incense burner that was uh, carbon dated. You know the carbon dating mechanism? 3,300 years before Christ. This is 200 years older than dynasty number one. In other words, this is older than Egypt. When somebody say, you know, you're older than death, you know. Well, this is older than death. <laughs> See? It's older than Egypt. 200 years older than Egypt. But why is that important? Well, it's important because you got everything that people call Egyptian symbolized on this little incense burner that's found in Nubia. In other words, these are black Nubians south of Egypt, you know, down around the Aswan Dam. You know, they built this big dam and they got all this water that covered over black civilization. So down at the bottom of that dam or at the bottom of that lake, all the archaeological things like this are now covered up. A few of them were rescued before the dam covered up parts of Nubia. And look at what's on it. A pharaoh sitting in the middle boat on his throne with a hat. Looks just like the hat the bishop wore going trying to convert some people in Africa. He should have been going to South Africa by the way. I think he got his directions mixed up. If he's trying to get some Christians, you know. Uh, that mean the Pope. You know, the Pope is over there now saving souls. I wish he'd go save the black souls in South Africa, you know, because the problem isn't in the mind. The problem is somewhere else. But here's the Pope's hat on the black African before there was any Popes. How you get that? You know, sitting in the boat litter, three boats, you see three of them in the underworld world. When you get to Egypt later on, pharaohs, when they die, get in these boats and they scoot across <laughs> on their way through the underworld. See, here they are doing this before there's an Egypt, before there are any pharaohs. You see a little bird sitting up on his shoulder. That's called Horus, the falcon. You know, Air Force Academy uses a falcon as its mascot. Atlanta uses the falcon. The falcon has been very, very important in African history because that represented Horus of the Trinity, the first holy trinity before there's any Christian, no Jews, no, uh, uh, no Islam, you know, no, no Buddhism, and here we are with a trinity, Osiris, Isis, and Horus, and there he is, represented as a bird, and you see the labyrinth over there on the left, in other words, all this stuff that's supposed to represent later civilization is sitting down there with the primitives, well, that's right, first again, that's what primitive means, right, <laughs> let's keep it then. Okay, 200 years later, we get us a pharaoh. Number one, this is the father of Egypt, Menes. Anybody here from Memphis, Tennessee? That's who your city is named for. Menes and Memphis. Memphis is named for Menes. So Memphis in Greece and Memphis in Tennessee are named for Mem Menes. First name was Aha. And look at his features. <laughs> look at his features. Straight out of Hunter's Point. <laughs> Straight out of Hunter's Point. See? Now we can take him out of Hunter's Point if we just play a little Mendelssohn, you see? All I have to do is play Mendelssohn and your mind goes, oh, that's European. <laughs> but if your eyes look at what's before you, you see that's Hunter's Point. So we probably should have a little Stevie Wonder with the picture <laughs> to set it up right, you see? Matter of fact, that's what I really want to do, is to get this presentation backed up by Stevie Wonder, or somebody like that, you know, somebody who really understands how to say what African people have to say. Because it's dissonant when you put Mendelssohn to Africa. It don't fit. Side view, you know. Now I'm going to skip through this real fast because what I'm going to say to you can be summarized very easy and I'll show you some of it that if you do what I'm doing, what you will find is that the physical evidence, the documentary evidence will tell you that dynasty number one through 12 were indigenous African dynasties. That's one through 12. And then something happens 
at Dynasty 12. And, and Dynasty 13, when that comes in, Asians come in. We call them Hyksos, the Hyksos king, come in and take part of Africa, just a little bit, the mouth of the Nile, the Nile Delta, and they become the Egyptians at that point. They're run out of Egypt in the 18th dynasty, at the beginning of the 18th dynasty, the one that King Tut was in. So 1 to 12 is black African. 18 is black African. 25 is black African. And after that, that was the end of black African dynasty. There's not a European dynasty until 30, the last one, in which everything got torn up, as usual. <laughs> That's Alexander the Great. There was a Persian dynasty and some Asian dynasties before that. Okay, that's important for us. Now, what I'm saying is that everything that I show on the documents tells me what I just told you in summary. And here's the first-hand documentation. These are the pharaohs. And all you have to see is they look like you and they look like the people who still are sitting there right now. Some of them <laughs> had a fierce battle with folk who recovered and saved them. <laughs> lost their noses, a lot of noses were lost, but dudes like this didn't lose their nose. Uh, Pharaoh Zosher, third dynasty. It's very important Pharaoh, by the way, because it was during his dynasty that Imhotep, the father of medicine, the world's first multi-genius. Uh, not Michelangelo. If Michelangelo is a copy of this man, 2700 BC. This is Imhotep, the father of medicine, architecture, painting, poetry. He had him. He had a little saying. Oh, I'm sorry, that's Zoser. That was the second. This is Imhotep. I should have been looking at my slide. But he had a little saying that you have had copied in Rome. His saying was, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. That sound familiar? That's called in Egyptian writing, the Song of Harper. You go back, that's old, that poem is old as Egypt. And this man loved to say that. <laughs> kick up your heels, kick back, lay back, have fun, because you're going to be dead tomorrow. <laughs> now, if that doesn't sound like a brother. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we mean by cultural unity. <laughs> See? And his name is Imhotep. But when George James says stolen legacy, he only repeats Herodotus. Because Herodotus, as an eyewitness, said, if you watch real close in Greece, you'll find that everything that we believe in in religion came out of Africa. All our gods have Greek names, but they really refer to African people because I found out Africans been worshiping these gods long before there was a Greece. Pick up Herodotus book two, so you won't say Asa said it, you'll say Herodotus said it. Now, if he, if he lied, I'm lying, see? <laughs> so there, Imhotep, your doctor swears by him. In this oath, every one of your doctors, any doctor in America who practices medicine has to raise his hands and say this, I swear by Apollo the physician and Aesculapius. And Aesculapius is Imhotep. In other words, that's the Greek name for an African god. And even a lot of black doctors don't know that. <laughs> they might hold their head up a little higher and swear a little louder if they knew. You ought to read the life of Imhotep. Again, right back to Hunter's Point, Harlem. You know, these are pharaohs. What you will see in most books, if you see anybody looking like these people, they'll say they were slaves of the Egyptians. They won't give you the dates, and they won't say that, yes, they're black slaves, just like they were white slaves. But you don't get the picture, the presidential calendar. That's what we want to do. Which one of the students here tonight is going to take that on as a project and give us a presidential calendar showing all the presidents of Egypt from day number one all the way down to the present time. If you had that physical calendar, there's no way in the world that people could give you the story about Africa they've been giving. Atmu, fifth dynasty. Other name, Atum, A-T-U-M. Another name, Atum, A-T-O-M. Physicist, A-T-O-M is the creative principle, isn't it? Took Einstein a long time to figure it out, but he was the genius of his time because he learned one thing, that energy and stuff are the same thing. All you have to do is take stuff and throw it at the speed of light, and it'll turn into energy. 
<laughs> Any kind of stuff. <laughs> Ain't that some stuff? Well, that was back there too. We knew that. Uh, but we said it another way. Ad dumb, A D A M. First principle, creative principle. And so ad dumb and ad tum and ad tom all are derived from the same meaning and are later copied by people who will write their own scriptures based on African scriptures that were written and copied and then later destroyed. Here they are again, back to Harlem. These are all pharaohs. I show you no slaves. Here's bishops before there are bishops. We're still in the first 12 dynasties. This is Pepe, uh, yeah, Pepe. And he's got Horace on his shoulders too. Same as the Air Force Falcon, right? That's their mascot. Then I want to show you again, when George James said stolen legacy, this is what thing he meant. Same kind of thing I showed you about the Sphinx being copied. The D. Young Museum and the L.A. Museum had the King Tut exhibit, and they advertised it. So I went down to L.A. and got me a copy of the L.A. Times one day. And I want you to see what the artists in L.A. think black folk look like. Now, this is the way they really look, according to their artists in their day, but this is the way the L.A. Times thinks they look. Stolen legacy. Just a little change here and there. You're going to see that a couple more times in the slide presentation. Prince Rahotep, 3600 B.C. Mentahutep. Go through the first 12 dynasties, and this is all you find is us. Amenemet III and his son wearing Bo Derek braids. <laughs> 12th dynasty. Well, we have to give credit, you know. Maybe she's reincarnated. <laughs> Notice the old name for Egypt used to be Sais, S-A-I-S. There's another group of people that still live there today, just south of Egypt, called Masais, or Masai. The prefix in Kiswahili means of, that's what Ma means, and so of Sais means the people of Egypt. And so the Masai look most like the people of Egypt that you're looking at right here. They look just like that. They've never left. You don't have to go anywhere to explain the people that you see. But Egyptologists did. They went so far as to take Egypt off the continent of Africa, remove all the black people out of Egypt, would do Sadat too if they could, and then take all the white people of Europe and put them into Egypt. So if you go over America right now and ask most people what continent Egypt is on, they'll put it in Asia or Europe. Psychologically, that's the trip that's been done. People even write books called Egypt and Africa. That's like saying California and America. That doesn't make any conceptual sense. That means so nobody is looking. Here's his sphinx. Now again, when I was showing you all the pictures of J.J., Fred Sanford, uh, all those men who were in the creation of the savage, why do you suppose all these images have been withheld? Don't you think we could have had one or two of these in our textbooks around first, second, third grade? Isn't there any professor that can explain to us who these people are? at universities like Stanford, San Francisco State, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, University of California, Berkeley. Or maybe these things don't exist. Maybe they're unnecessary to view. Free your mind. Okay, I'm skipping to the 18th dynasty. And I'm skipping because if you go to the dynasties that I mentioned, where, where invaders came in, you will find Asians or mixed African-Asian pharaohs shown on the monument. So don't say that Asa said there were no people who didn't look like Africans on the monument. I'm telling you there were. But I'm telling you, I'm showing you from dynasties 1 to 12, we're going to skip to 18. This is the big bad dynasty. See, the first big bad dynasty was dynasty 1 to 7, because that's when they did all the big pyramid building. The skyscrapers were built. All the big ones were built by then. That's very important to know. Before Egypt got invaded, they were built. Now we're going to the 18th dynasty and they're kicking people out. They're kicking the Hyksos kings out. Who are the dudes that are kicking them out? Dudes who are kicking them out are people like Tutmosis. This is the minimo here. We're going to skip past him because I want you to see Tutmosis. The second. And again, 
One little thing I'd like to point out about Egyptian names. If you look, it says T-H-U-T or T-H-O-T and M-E-S. One of the things you need to know about Egyptian language is in hieroglyphics, there are no vowels, only consonants. So the way that would be spelled is T-H-T-M-S. That's the way it would be written in hieroglyphics. There would be no E, U, or O. So you couldn't tell now how those words were pronounced. And so, for example, mess, M-S, could be or was Moses, what we say Moses. So you see, Tut Moses is older than Moses. And that's why they say Moses was a common name in Africa, Moses. So the Moses of the Bible was simply picking up an African name. In fact, he was an African with an African name. And I just like to point that out to you because Tut Moses is the child of Toth. That's what Moses means, little baby, the child of Toth, the God Toth. Notice that this is a brother. Now, this is the thing that brought Diop out of his seat because he decided that people that were looking at these mummies and didn't want to give credit to Africa or black Africa for the mummies. And so what they did was to say that these black-skinned mummies were black because of the process of embalming. Now, these are the people who have done the best work on embalming. We still can't embalm the way the Egyptians embalm. They say embalming fluid turns you black. <laughs> now, if you stop there, you in trouble. But Diop, being a man of an inquisitive mind, said, well, how could we prove? Since they want to say that the black skin is not natural, he said, I'll check it out. What does natural black skin have in it that natural white skin doesn't? Melanin. Does the melanin stay there even after something's been dead for a long time? Yes. Even after 200,000 years? Yes. How do we know? Because fish fossils found still have the melanin content in them. So, mummies ought to have the melanin content in them. And if melanin is in there, that's what's responsible for the skin color, not embalming fluid. So when he checks it out, sure enough, it's melanin content that's responsible for the dark skin of the mummies. Proving again what he'd been trying to say before. This is the daughter of Tutmosis II. She was given the queenship after daddy died. She said, look, the king, Tutmosis, Tut, said, hey, <laughs> this is Hat Shep Sut, you know, I don't know what her nickname was, but she must have had one with a long name like that. There's no way in the world daddy's going to call her Hat Shep Sut. <laughs> so he probably called her Sut. And she said, yes, daddy Tut. So daddy said, look, uh, you the oldest, and you know how black parent families are. The oldest takes care of the babies. Some of you in here did that, and I know I had to do it. Uh, I was the oldest. And mother said, you take care of your brother and sister. You hear? And that's what daddy told her. Said, I'm dying now, but you're going to be the queen until your little brother gets bigger, and then you turn over the throne to him. And Hatshep said, yes, daddy, I'll do it. As Soon as he died, she went straightway and started kicking up her heels and building monuments of herself. Stuff like this. Buildings like this which you can still go see. Finest palace ever been built by any of the pharaohs built by this woman pharaoh. Little brother's getting older and older. <laughs> yeah. And he's saying, I'm pharaoh, sister, you know, I'm Tut the Third, and you only had Shep Sut. And, and daddy told you to keep the throne for me, and I'm old enough now, I'm 18. They said, no, that's only in California. <laughs> you got to be 21. And he got to be 21, and Sut wasn't given any indication that she was ready to move. The dude is almost in menopause, you know. <laughs> and, and finally, he decided, if I'm going to ever be Pharaoh, I'm going to have to trick this sister. So he tricked her one day. I won't tell you the story how he did it, but he did, and got his throne, you know. And then he was so mad at her, and he went all over trying to knock down everything she had, get to stuff like this. And he went out on the front like little boys would do, you know, with injured egos. And anywhere his sister's name was on there, he scratched it off. And then takes a mortar and put his name in. <laughs> but he didn't do a good job, you know, because some places it fell off, the mortar, you know. And we still know that that was her tomb. That's an interesting family, you know. <laughs> and this is little brother, you know. But when he did get in, he had so much hostility pent up against Sut 
that he took off and kicked the behinds of all the Asians, you know, that misplaced aggression. Asians hadn't bothered him that much. You know, they just took a little piece of Egypt. So he kicked them out. He says, get out and don't come back. And he says, and just to make sure I'm coming to your house where you are. So he's one of the first pharaohs, went all the way up into Asia and into Europe. In other words, black people controlled part of Asia and Europe 1,600 years before Christ. That's also before Homer. That's before Europe. He's responsible. And that's his mummy in the middle, in case you want to argue some more. Just like Herodotus said, big nose, thick lip, black skin, not much hair. <laughs> okay, the games that people play. San Francisco, the Young Museum, uh, showing Pharaoh Akhenaten, showing, according to Egyptologists, white Pharaoh Akhenaten. Now, Pharaoh Akhenaten, though, obviously doesn't look like the, quote, white norm, unquote. And what's abnormal about him? Well, if you read the article, if you can see down at the bottom, it says that uh, he has a sickness. And his sickness is that lips are swollen. <laughs> and that's unnatural for a Britisher. <laughs> British people don't have big lips like that. Except Churchill, you know, people. <laughs> a, few, a few of them do, and we know where they came from. <laughs> So he said, uh, right here, <laughs> that the man is sick. So a Kennerton was sick. And notice it. We look at him again, he gets a little bit sicker. <laughs> He's looking just like those people out in Hunters Point again. And so we have, uh, we even have a, the name of his sickness. The medical doctors got busy and said, hey man, if y'all keep showing these pictures, nobody's gonna believe you now. They said, well, you better come up with an illness. And they said, well, okay, well, he, he had frolic syndrome. That makes white people's lip puffy. <laughs> and that was, that's probably what he had. That's why he's all misshapen like that. Got big old belly, you know, all overeating, he'll do the same thing. So here he is, sick like that. Only problem was, frolic syndrome makes you sterile. This dude has six daughters. After he had frolic syndrome, if he had it. You see, this is kind of idiocy to hide the content of uh, African civilization. Here is uh, the sickest that he got, you know, <laughs> Pharaoh Akhenaten. Now, this man is very important to us today. When I say Africa's mother of Western civilization, as I'm copying Joe Cannon when I say that, Joseph Ben Joe Cannon. When I say that, uh, what I'm saying is here's an example of the parenthood of religion in Africa from the religion of Isis and Osiris, which was the old time religion. When people sing, give me that old time religion, that's the religion of Isis and Osiris. And then all of a sudden comes this upstart, Akhenaten, went changed his name. You know, why he changed his name, you know, like Kareem Jabbar? Why don't he leave his name like it was? See, his name used to be Amen Ophis. Amen Ophis, that's who he used to be. And he got ready to change his religion. He was named after the God, Amen. Every time you say your prayers, at the end, if you say them, you say, Amen. That's a black African God, too, one of the oldest. So he was named after that black African God, which is great, 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 great grandparents. And uh, he changed it to Ankh Inaten. Ankh meaning the living symbol of Aten, which meant the sun god. He said, there's gonna be one god. I'm getting rid of Isis, Osiris, and Horus, because they got some priests that know all the stuff about those dudes. And how will I ever be king if the religious group is controlling the minds of the people? That sound familiar? Politicians know that religion is a competitor for politics. And so he says, I'm gonna invent a new religion and I'll be the Pope. I'll be in charge of it. So he did, moved, moved the city capital, went on out into uh, Telemara, built a whole new town, took his wife Nefertiti with him, changed the religion of Africa to the religion of one God, wrote some psalms that you'll later see copied in the Bible. The song or songs of Akhenaten you'll find in the, in the Bible. You can put them side by side. The sayings of Aminimo and some of the songs that come from Akhenaten are just like the psalms of David who copied them later on. Okay, well here he is. Ankh and Natan. And he had a little brother too. Now we don't know whether it's his brother or his son. 
But according to the little brother, he said, that's my brother because they got the same daddy. Now, usually when you have same daddy, that makes you brothers, right? Well, King Tut said, my daddy was a minnow feast the third. That's on the red granite lion statue of uh, King Tut in the British Museum. That's where it says it. Okay, my daddy was a minnow feast the third. Well, his daddy, minnow feast the third, was the same as Akhenaten's daddy, minnow feast the third. And so here come little King Tut in the day when this man has taken Egypt on a new time religion and Lil King Tut at the age of nine after his uncle, I, had apparently killed King, Tut, King uh, Akhenaten here, killed this one. Uh, no one says that, you can't prove that, I'm speculating on it, but he was dead anyway. And he was dead at the right age, you know, at the right age for an uncle who wanted to be a pharaoh. <laughs> he said, man, this man's gonna live forever, I will never get to be pharaoh. And so suddenly, at a nine-year-old age, Tut becomes the pharaoh after his brother uh, is no longer pharaoh. And Tut becomes pharaoh for, for about nine years. He dies at about the age of 18. The boy pharaoh, he didn't, he didn't do anything because Uncle I was standing in the background saying, do this, do that, and the other. And after he dies, Uncle I becomes the pharaoh at about 70. So he finally realized his wish. So I think Uncle I off both of them. <laughs> Well, there he is. Now, he might have gotten his sickness from these grandparents of his. Grandparent, uh, uh, these are mummies of the grandparents. So I'll let your eyes tell you what they were. Uh, look just like a Messiah woman over there, doesn't she, grandmother? Or he gets his sickness from his mother, Queen T. That's a Kennington's mother. She's always shown as a black woman. There she is, Nubian woman. Now he said that's mother, and white Egyptologist says a Kenneton is sick because he looks like his mother <laughs> and looks like his father. And this is mother and daddy, a minnow feast the third and queen T. And notice one thing. This is the first time in Egyptian history that you'll find co-regents, man and woman, ruling equally side by side. Say he loved us so much that he do anything for her. Now what we said in our neighborhood, man, you got the nose wide open. <laughs> so his, his nose was open out in the heat. He's out there building a lake in the desert so that after her sauna, she could go get in her boat and fan herself on the lake, you know. So the sister had to be powerful, Queen T. You know, no matter what they say about the black woman, we know where the strength comes from. And so this is Nefertiti, the wife of a Kenneton, according to the Berlin Museum. This is the famous Berlin bus. You'll notice that anything that looks Caucasian, people will rush to display that. And so here's the Berlin bus. And I'm not gonna tell you that's not Nefertiti, although some Egyptologists say, you can't tell whether that's Nefertiti or not. And they even claim that that's uh, a Kenneton's daughter and Nefertiti's daughter, not Nefertiti. But that's the one that people have hanging around their necks, you know, the, the statue, the bust of Nefertiti. So I can't say that's not her, but what we can do is go to the tomb that didn't move. See, the head moved. <laughs> you don't know where the head was when you found it. You don't know where it came from. But presumably her tomb has not moved. And in her tomb, this is the way the artist pictures Nefertiti. Back to Hunter's point again. And she's sick just like her husband. <laughs> and this is the oldest statue of the nose and mouth of Nefertiti. It's a fragment off of that. These are the daughters of Akhenaten and Nefertiti. And once again, Bo Derek inspired their braids. And of course, these are the daughters of Akhenaten and Nefertiti with no hair. I'd like to point out something else. When you can't deny, remember I said perceptual distortion was mental illness, denial of reality is mental illness. I'm giving you examples of that. Looking at these little children here with long heads, their sickness, since they're, you know, they say, well, not too bad, but the heads are too long. And then they'll, they'll uh, make up names for it, like long cephalus, <laughs> give it something Latin and make it sound scientific. They're abnormal. No Europeans have heads like that. 
you know, basically, other than Eastern Europeans, which are close to Africans. They used to call them sugarloaf heads at Ellis Island when they were given these IQ tests. <laughs> but African women by the thousands have heads like that. Watusi women, if you wrap their heads uh, as children, as a matter of fact, if their heads aren't like that, mothers think it's so beautiful that they want to make sure that their kids are not abnormal, so they wrap their heads. And that's not just an isolated instance. Thousands of African women in East Africa still, you don't have to go anywhere to explain that physiognomy. This is King Tut, the golden mask of King Tut. And of course, the LA Times uh, advertised the exhibit, and so I was down there again checking out all the advertisements. I always want to see the advertisement in LA Times because uh, they have some interesting artists. Now the artist looked at this mask and then he drew this picture. Stolen legacy. Just like George James said. Just like Bo Derrick did. King Tut, the way his artist saw him. King Tut, the way the LA Times saw him. It doesn't take a whole lot to shade the truth to deny reality, to have perceptual distortion. That's why you go to the source. King Tut is a boy. King Tut, in the famous posture characteristic of our race, the, <laughs> the deuce and a quarter lean. <laughs> This is the big statue of King Tut. And this is King Tut's mummy. If you don't like statues and artist conception, look at he himself. And he has the same sickness that the Kennetons' daughters had, that long head, you know. <laughs> and the big lips, too, by the way. And this is the uncle who I think off both of them. Uncle I. <laughs> and uh, wanted to show you that we are leaving the 18th dynasty moving to the 19th dynasty, Sep, uh, Seti the Great in the upper left, put him up there because we also have what's supposed to be his mummy. You have to be very careful with any mummies though in Egypt because people move mummies around because grave robbers were always in there. As a matter of fact, people used to use the mummies in Egypt for mummy dust. You know, this is one of the reasons that people have always studied black people because we're supposed to be, you know, uh, creative and energetic and all these kind of things. And also, we're supposed to be aphrodisiac because people actually ground up the mummy bones and sold them in drugstores all over Europe and ate the mummy. You know, you know that's aphrodisiac. <laughs> then go to Africa after having eaten dead mummy bones <laughs> and call Africans <laughs> Cannibals. <laughs> this is Shabaka, 25th dynasty. You read about him in your Bible, if you read the Bible anymore. I think it's important to read the Bible because that's really some of the best history that we have. It's, uh, a lot of the history was destroyed. Remember, African history has been destroyed every time it's been built. Three different times, the Library of Alexandria in Africa was destroyed. 500 BC by the Persians, 58 BC before Christ by the uh, uh, Julius Caesar, and by Christian bishops about 320 years or so after Christ was dead. And that was the last library we had till we began to get more. And then in Timbuktu and Jenny in the Republic of Mali and Songhai, those libraries were also destroyed. As a matter of fact, those libraries existed before Europe had higher education institutions. And Europe gets its higher education institutions from Africans who established them in Spain and Portugal. The first university in Europe was created by Africans. Moors who crossed over from Africa to Europe were up there about 800 years and left their genes there. You can find them there today. Anybody wants to talk about miscegenation, the first place to study it is in Europe, not Africa or America because it started up there first. And so if anybody says they don't want it, what they have to say is they don't want any more of it because they had plenty of it, okay? We're going to show that too. This is uh, Tirhakwa. And again, these are pharaohs that you read about in the Bible. 
Now, one of the things you're going to have problems with is, some, is squaring some things you read with some of the facts. For example, which pharaoh got drowned? What was his name? We know all the names of the pharaohs. We got the records. Which one? Why would you write history and never name the pharaoh? The one that got drowned. You see? Which one? Ramses? That's the one they say. Well, well how did he get drowned? We got his mummy. <laughs> he got lost and drowned. Well, I mean, little, little things that you have to ask questions about. And here's Bo Derek back in the old days. And the mummies that had corn roll. Okay, they had plenty of those mummies. Okay, we have a few more in uh, they're switching trays for us back. And you see another mummy with corn roll. And I want to point out in the upper right hand corner is a man with a nose that didn't exist. They actually recreated the nose. That's artist's conception of nose. The mummy had no nose. So when the mummy gets a nose, I think they sent the LA Times artist back there <laughs> to fix the nose. And here is the Temple of Luxor. This is the 18th Dynasty building. Temple of Luxor in Africa. The original structure, we don't find structures older than this that look like this anywhere else in the world. But we do find structures later than this, like the Acropolis in Greece, in Athens. So when you take your hard-earned money and take your trip to Greece, which everybody does, I did, and enjoyed it. And I was irresistibly drawn to Athens, because people had told me all my life that that's where you have to go if you're going to get any culture, boy. So I did, you know, and I mused among the halls of the Acropolis. Went to the Parthenon and the Pantheon, dwelt with the gods, but they weren't there. <laughs> they were on vacation back home in Luxor at the time. This is the beginning of the Masonic order. It begins in Luxor. This is the beginning of the university. It begins in Luxor. These are the places where the Greeks went to school, and they say they went to school. Greeks were not racist. You know, they thought they were good Greeks. Romans were basically not racist. Matter of fact, some of the Romans had African emperors. You didn't know that Septimus Severus was uh, an African emperor of Rome, came from Carthage, and there were five others besides him. So those people back there told the truth, but later on scholars omitted the truth. Here's one of the things that we found out after we learned to read the hieroglyphics again. Remember, I'm telling you that they were reading Egyptian or African writing. Writing begins in Africa. Paper begins in Africa. That's why it has the name paper, papyrus. That's what the name paper comes from, the original writing material. Okay, they had written on papyrus all of these little funny signs. And people came in, the bishops the last time, said, close up those churches and universities because they're competition for the one we want to start. That's why African education was destroyed. And you're going to see why, too, because here we have, remember we said stolen legacy? You go up to the Supreme Court building, and you'll find the same thing on the Supreme Court building that you find in the oldest book in Africa, the Book of the Dead. This is the papyrus of Ani, with inscriptions from the Book of the Dead. And you'll see over there on the left, the same thing you see on the Supreme Court building, the scale of justice. In Egypt, they call it the scale of truth and justice because truth and justice mean the same thing in Egypt, but that doesn't mean the same thing in America. <laughs> and so you'll see in this scale, the heart of Osiris, that's what justice meant, is your heart. Can your heart be weighed against truth? Not can your heart be weighed against logic? Those are two different things. Think about that very heavily. And this is what justice was all about. And so you got a dude over there reading the scales of justice. There's always somebody over there, the undertaker, the one that looks like the jackal. They call him the judge. I wrote a paper called Performing the Jackal Function. The jackal function is judgment. The jackal is called the judge because he has to know when to eat dead food. In other words, you can't, if dead food gets to a certain point and, and even the jackal can't get any nourishment from it anymore. So he buries a dead body of an animal and then goes back later and digs it up. But he has to know exactly the moment when he can dig it up and still eat it. So that's very fine judgment. That's why he's checking the scales very finely. And you'll see uh, the moving finger having written, writes, and then moves on. You'll see Toth, the writer up there who writes history. So he's recording for Ani, the dude in the white. He's, he's dead now and he's trying to get into heaven. And so they're checking out his credentials. 
And he's standing up before the throne of God, being led by Horus, the bird or the falcon. And the God in this case is Osiris. And listen to what he has to say. And that's what's written in those writings up there that people tried to hide. I have not killed, I have not stolen, I have not borne false witness, I have not coveted. Did that begin to sound anything like something you heard before? Yeah, stolen legacy even includes the Ten Commandments. They said thou should not steal and did. Because you're looking at it with your eyes. This is older than Moses. This is the negative confessions. And you can find the negative confessions in the Book of the Dead. You got 875, go over to your bookstore, buy the book, Book of the Dead. You can get it in hieroglyphics or in English if you choose. <laughs> Turn to the back of the book, where we always are, and you will find not commandments, but confessions. Because you don't have to be commanded to do anything. Commandment is people who believe in force, and their God has to force you to do this. Our God says, just you better behave yourself because <laughs> laughing is catching while your big mouth is stretching. <laughs> See, we learn that. And so we confess. We come in. We say, well, Daddy, you know, I didn't do all of those things that you told me not to do. And so there's 142 of those negative confessions. Now, Moses was an Egyptian priest and learned in all the wisdom of Egypt according to history and according to the Bible. And so as an Egyptian priest, one of the wisdom pieces that he studied was the Book of the Dead. And so it's not strange to me that the Ten Commandments are included in that 146 negative confessions. Because Moses was a, an Egyptian priest at the time of Pharaoh Akhenaten, who started the new religion of one God. And was put out because of that, because people were angry with him. And so it must be the fact that Moses took off with a group of people and continued that religion that had already existed in Africa. Now, if you think I'm the first person to say that, I'm going to show you somebody else that you might believe in a moment that said exactly the same thing about 33 years ago. Now, we wouldn't know any of this except for this rock that Napoleon found called the Rosetta Stone. And it has hieroglyphic writing at the top. It has... Uh, kind of like a cursive Egyptian writing in the middle and has Greek writing on the bottom, but each one of those has the same message. And so it was in her child, you saw the father, you're looking at the Trinity before there's a Christianity. Now you have to tell me what that means. And when Christian religion begins in an organized fashion, begun by a politician, Constantine, not by a pope or a preacher, Constantine, the emperor starts the Christian religion. He calls all the bishops together in 323 and says, look, come to Nicaea. And in Nicaea, I want you all to get together and quit fighting. Come up with one religion that we can all go for. I'm going to put the power of the throne behind it. And then we're going to close up all the rest of them, including especially those religions from Africa, which is the religion of Isis and Horus and Osiris. But after we close them up, we're still going to keep their features, such as the virgin mother. So the first virgin mother is always shown as black Isis. This is the oldest statue of the Christian Mary that you can find. She's shown as a black woman. And you still find her all over the world shown as the black virgin mother with her black child. When the Pope went into Poland, he was preceded by the black virgin Madonna and child. In 1836, Godfrey Higgins, a British historian, wrote a book called Anacalypsis, and he named all the churches in Europe that still, in 1836, had black Madonnas and child. But as these statues were changed, then they hired the LA Times <laughs> to paint them. And so we get some changes. So, but before that, we still find them, the Virgin of Kazan. We find them up in Russia. Here's a white Russian woman with a black Madonna and child. And then we miseducate America by teaching that ISIS is white. <laughs> Stolen legacy. George James was right. This is the God men. And you know exactly what happened to him as soon as the missionaries found him. He said, boy, cover yourself up. And more than that, they castrated the gods. But those uh, statues had another meaning, which was the creative principle. And if you look at the place where his penis is placed, it's placed at the umbilical cord, not 
in the normal place for a penis. They weren't talking about sex. What they were talking about is using the, the phallic symbol as a symbol of the creative principle, but it's also attached to the place where the baby receives its nourishment when it's born. There's a lot more to it if you want to get into it, but you'll get books on Egyptian religion. And so people with no religion came in and tried to change the religion of the most religious people on the face of the earth. By the testimony of Homer, they were the most religious. Who is Jesus? Newsweek? All the people painting Jesus, nobody saw him. <laughs> Rembrandt painting Jesus, he's, Jesus has been dead for 1,700 years, you know. Uh, you know. Here, here's Rembrandt trying, you know, Salvador Dali's painting Jesus, you know, and you got them all in the Bible, Rembrandt's Jesus, uh, Renoir's Jesus, Dali's Jesus. So if I put my Jesus in there, everybody wants to get mad, carrying affirmative action too far. <laughs> Except the way the Romans saw Jesus in the oldest picture that you can find of Christ, 4th century A.D., Catacombs of Rome. You can go there today and still see this picture of Jesus. He doesn't look anything like Rembrandt's rendition. Now you begin to understand the function of art. See, Michelangelo was the Cecil B. DeMille of his day. Pope Julius said, Mike, got a job for you. See, I know it's cold here in Rome at this time of year, but we got this nice chapel a lot of folk come to church every Sunday. Mike, I want you to uh, get up there in the top. And Ju Ju Mike said, Pope Julius, you mean way up in the top of this chapel? He said, I want you to paint a few faces up there that, you know, the Romans can identify with. And so Mike went up on his back in the Sistine Chapel, and Pope wouldn't let him down until he got God, Jesus, and the Holy Family. And guess who he used as models? He used... His, his uh, uncle and his aunt for Mary and Joseph. And he used his first cousin as a model for Jesus. Now this is long after Jesus has been dead. <laughs> and so that's why Jesus comes out the way he did with Michelangelo and God comes out the way he did. He's looking at contemporary models like the LA Times. See, that becomes very important. And so you begin to think that that is the natural Jesus, you see. Well, no one that I know of who was living with Jesus painted him. So all of the pictures of Jesus are artist's conception. But most people don't believe that. They believe there's one that's right. And I don't feel comfortable unless he got blonde hair and blue eyes. So if I see anything else in church, I'm going to quit. That's because you know the catechism of Christianity, but not the history of Christianity. Those are different. Sixteen crucified saviors would inform you about that. This book went out of print. Try to find it. If you have a good library, that's a good test of your library. See if you can find Cursey Gray's book. Then read it, and you'll see why it went out of print. So we're not talking about poor scholarship. We're not talking about affirmative action, are we? We're not talking about special admission. We're talking about truth. The prophet Isaiah, 5th century A.D., shown next to a Greek woman shown as a black African, next to an Ethiopian priest holding the sistrum in his hand, just like the sistrum that Osiris held, the religion of the world coming out of Africa. And then we get Cecil B. DeMille to tell you those stories again, because you might have gotten it wrong if you looked at the way it was portrayed in the beginning. So all the features become those of Victor Mature, Carlton Heston, and uh, pretty soon, after you've had the Ten Commandments and the Bible and Ben-Hur, you can no longer imagine that black people belong in the Middle East. Free your mind. The, the, the architecture of Africa had meaning. You go down, there's a pyramid downtown in San Francisco, most famous building down there. It has no philosophical meaning. It has no religious meaning. It's simply a pyramid. But when Africans built buildings, they represented humanity and life itself. For example, you see that the Temple of Luxor, you can put a human skeleton on top of that temple. And every human skeleton, unless it's deformed, will fit in such a way that the vital parts of the human body are corresponding with vital parts of the building of the Temple of Luxor. Because that building was supposed to represent a man walking and moving and living and growing. And I could give you a lot more about it, but I'm not going to take the time to do it. I simply want to point out that the tip of the man's skull is not in the building. 
because in the African religion that referred to the Holy of Holies. Now people see Holy of Holies and they don't even know what it means. Holy of Holies meant that was the part of the body that lived on, the consciousness lived on after death. And so you didn't represent that as a part of the corporal or physical body. So architecturally it wasn't necessary to make allowances for it. And this is why the beetle is a sacred beetle in Egypt because the skull of the human and the back of the beetle look very much alike. All the Buddhas, the oldest statues, if you get the first hand data, you will see them to be nappy headed and black. You can go buy them in uh, uh, little shops right now and many of them are still nappy headed and black. People say, well that's because it refers to the underworld. It refers to the fact they're African, you know. <laughs> People have trouble with that. In India, the Buddhas were African. You go to India today, you don't have to look far for Africans in India if you haven't been anywhere, you know. But if you go somewhere and you look, there are a group of people there now called the Dravidians that look just like people in this room. I mean, you'd be right there and you'd be called a, a Dravidian because they were the first people of India. You go all over the world and you will find that those pygmies popped out like a flower. And that's the African diaspora. And if you can't explain African history from the beginning up to now, then you've been miseducated. We've got to reconstruct the whole thing. Medical doctors will know that Imhotep was on to something when they look at the prescription for birth control 1,500 years before Christ was born. And this prescription is one in which you take the leaf from the acacia tree and mash it and let the juices ferment mix that with honey and insert that in the woman on a medical tampon that turns into lactic acid which is the active chemical agent in contraceptive jelly that you buy at Walgreens 1500 years before Christ. In Africa and Ethiopia here are the Falasha Jews in Ethiopia still black just like they used to be in the beginning tracing their line all the way back to Solomon's temple still building their houses and you're looking at the top of a straw house with Mogan David's star at the top. Still reading from the first five books of Moses, unchanged since the beginning. The name Falasha means immigrant, which means they immigrated from the Sinai Peninsula into Africa, the continent, and in, had settled and maintained their identity as Hebrews from the first time on. Why? would you suppose that the Hebrews still look black? Because in the beginning, when the Hyksos came in, the Haribu and others who came from Asia and Abraham's family, there was only 70 people, 12 tribes, settled in Africa and intermarried. And 400 years later, go out half a million strong. You can't get a half a million out of 70 unless you do a little mixing. And quite clearly, the Hebrew people who exited us from the continent were actually indeed African as well as Asian people. And so some of those people stayed on the continent are still there in Ethiopia today. Some of them have realigned themselves with Israel. Here happens to be a Falasha in Israel and people have been debating whether they are authentic Hebrews or not. Ask the Falasha. Tipu Tib, without him, Livingston and Stanley would have been failures and they said so. And probably they should have been because I don't think you want to claim him even though he's a brother because he was pretty ruthless. Livingston and Stanley walked past Africans who were making carbon steel 2,000 years before it could be made in Europe. So when they saw it, people still didn't know what Africans were doing in those little mud huts. I guess they thought they were breaking, baking bread or something. And here those men were sitting down there making steel. And how they did it, uh, those of you who are in science, you want to know Africa, mother of Western science, look at it. Here they are with uh, pipes that are inserted into the coals through the bottom, and they have a bellows that blows air, which becomes hot as it travels through the pipe, gets into the coal, raising the temperature of the air approximately to 600 degrees. And as that hot air hits the coals, it boosts the temperature high enough to produce carbon content in the steel. So here you have hard steel being produced by the primitives again. 2,000 years almost before it could be done. Read the Journal of African Civilization and Science Magazine for that documentation. Africans in Europe. Africans didn't simply stay in America. Carter Woodson, who you heard read from, 
started in 1916, the Journal of Negro History. In the very first issue, he had an article on the African civilization. And you can see it in the table of contents. But I want you to watch this. This is volume two, 1917. This is how long some black people have been conscious. Carter Wilson, if you look in the uh, uh, middle, you'll see the African origin of the Grecian civilization by George Wells Parker, written in 1917, based on articles that he read in the Greek originally. Why was it if these kind of articles were being written in 1916 and 17, it takes black historians so long to quit talking about slavery at the beginning of the black Americans' experience. It was people like this who didn't get a degree from Stanford, San Francisco State, Berkeley, Harvard, and Yale, who had free minds. This poor man didn't have any degrees. He didn't have a community college certificate. Didn't have a high school diploma or a junior high school education. Matter of fact, he didn't have any schooling to amount to much. He just happened to be a genius, and he studied all over the world at his own expense. He was only a Pullman porter, but he was a free mind. And so he wrote a lot of books that no one wanted to publish. They still haven't published Sex and Race, one, two, three volumes. They still haven't published Nature Knows No Color Line, Man the Superman. Only The World's Great Men of Color has been published by Collier Macmillan. But this man was the one that gave us a lot of new data or at least call it to our attention in a new way. Uh, he was the one that went to China and India and looked in the libraries of Europe and found evidence of people like Africans in Europe. This is Memnon in the lower left. And you see black African women as saints and as leaders in Greece. These are people in Greece at the time that Africa and Greece are still in active interaction. You notice the woman at the top is the goddess Melanis and the name Melanin and Melanis <laughs> ought to say something to you about her name being related to her skin color. Remember Alexander the Great, as soon as he got to Africa, first thing he did was go straight out into the desert to consult the fortune teller, which they called the oracle. Because oracles in Greece came from Africa. The first oracle at Delphi was an African oracle. Read Greek literature and you'll find that out. Uh, Hannibal was an African. These are coins with him and his elephant. Now again, denial of reality says that people look at the coin and say that Hannibal had an elephant, which is shown on the coin, but the head is his elephant driver and not Hannibal. Now, I don't know why you put the commander's head in, or put the slave's head instead of the commander's head, but that is Hannibal's hair, his nappy head itself, not the elephant driver. <laughs> and you know what Hannibal did. Now, if you want to read about these kind of things, you can read Blacks in Antiquity. Again, I show you the books to show you that there's no absence of things to read. They simply don't appear on most of the bibliographies that you get. This is a Harvard professor, Frank Snowden, who wrote the book Blacks in Antiquity. That, that's, that's the documentary evidence that blacks were in Greece. That's what that is, okay? This is a man who did the same thing with literature. This is William Leo Hansberry. This is one of the ones I'm telling you that never got to see any of his books in print. You'll see that this is edited by his friend who is now chairman of the history department at Howard University, Joe Harris. And what this man did was to take everything that had ever been written by Greeks and see what they said about Africa. And so this book is the documents with the Greeks speaking for themselves. That's what we mean by returning to the source. You don't have to ask someone to interpret for you what they think Greeks thought of Africa. And when you read what the Greeks said themselves in their own words, there is no way that you can write the same history of Africa that other people have written because they respected, admired, looked up to Africa in their own words. And this is shown by Professor Hansberry. Uh, Professor Jones up at the University of Washington in Seattle has done the research again on classical material to document the presence of Africa in Europe long before Columbus. And this is the picture of Septimus Severus, the uh, w first African, first one that we can document, African emperor of Rome. And this is uh, some of the other Africans who were in Europe. I'm doing this because people try to tell you all Africans did in Europe was hold that little lantern out in front of white people's houses and drive coaches. These are people who are in the ruling family. This is Alessandro de Medici. Daddy was a pope. He became head of the de Medici family and also became the Duke of Florence. And that's his mother. Uh, all these things are things that Joel Rogers dug up because they hadn't trained him well enough not to see. See what I'm trying to say? 
it becomes very important to get an education and not training. Remember about the rat? <laughs> and, okay. Here's Joel Rogers who says, they tell me no black people in Europe, but every time I turn the pages in these books that register the family crest in Europe, I keep seeing black faces. And not only that, every time, and this is a document out of a German registry of the royal families. You see, the noble families. And you look up there, and here's this black man with big lips and nappy head right at the top. And guess what his name is? Mr. Black. <laughs> That's what Schwartz means in German, is black. Guess what his name is in France? His name is Mr. Lenoir. What does that mean? You speak French. That means Mr. The Black. You know, what does it mean? What, when he turns over to the European book in England and he finds the same black man in there and his name is Morrison, what does that mean? Son of the Moor or Mr. Black. Okay, there's 597 of these family crests that Joel Rogers, the Pullman Porter, unschooled but highly educated, found before he quit counting. Morrison, Moretti, Maurice, Lenoir, Mora, uh, Fitzmaurice, Muir Woods, Agnes Moorhead and Edward R. Murrow. <laughs> now, I read a book the other day on Irish history by an Irish historian, and it's called The History of Ireland. And in the history of Ireland, he says that in the seventh century, there was a group of African sea rovers that came up the coast in the Atlantic, calling themselves Fomorians. Not for Morians, <laughs> but Fomorians which meant the black folk coming from Africa up the Atlantic Ocean in the seventh century, taking part of Scotland, staying there a while, having some babies, leaving their name, teaching people how to dance, the Morris dance, which they still dance, but make sure you paint your face black when you dance this dance so you know this dance came from Africa, and that's the national dance of England today, the Morris or Moorish dance. And this is the Queen of England. Uh, great-grandmother of uh, Queen Victoria. So Queen Victoria had African lineage. Lots of people have African lineage. And uh, we haven't dealt with that. Robert Browning has African lineage. There he is in the lower left. Alexander Dumas in the upper right, who's author of The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo, with no black musketeers in the movies, but the black man wrote the book. Okay? He's African-European. Colette, the French author, is African-European. Beethoven is African-European. You see him on the left, and you see a picture of a black American on the right for comparison. Now, anybody who gets upset about this, just go pick up Joel Rogers' book, Sex and Race, Volume 1, and you'll find all the footnotes you want by Beethoven's contemporaries. But don't be too surprised when you find out that Beethoven was not the only famous European musician that was African-European. Uh, so was Mozart and Haydn. And Pushkin, the poet. And he wrote a nice little book about granddaddy. You know how black people like granddaddies? He says, I'm going to write a book about my granddaddy. And who was my granddaddy? My granddaddy was the Negro of Peter the Great. And so the Negro of Peter the Great is one of Pushkin's books that was written in honor of his grandfather, who was an African that grew up and was raised by Peter the Great of Russia. And Pushkin then became, as his grandson, one of the greatest poets of, Ru of Russia and Poland. One of the poets who was the first, he was the first to write poetry at the national level in the Russian language because Russians felt like their language was inferior. And so they were writing in French and German when they want, you know how we do? <laughs> when you really want to do right, you name your child a French name and speak in French. You know, Le Fleur, you know, rhymes with manure. <laughs> well, at any rate, Pushkin told the Russians, your language is just as good as anybody else's. You don't have to feel inferior. And they didn't. And so they had great poetry. This is his great-granddaughter, Pushkin's great-granddaughter. And this is her grandson. And uh, you can see what's going to happen if it keeps on. <laughs> There won't be much melanin left in the family. <laughs> he was a member of British royalty, by the way. In other words, this is what happened. Africans were up there, and their genes are still there, if genes mean anything. And they tell me at this university that they mean a lot. Maurice, uh, patron saint of Germany. In other words, more than slaves were up there. 
Uh, Ira Aldridge was up there in the last century. Uh, changed the way people did Shakespeare, by the way. He was so good. Played, he didn't just play black roles. He wasn't just playing, I'm going to show you his picture again, because he didn't just play Othello. You see him here in The Merchant of Venice and King Lear. He played white parts, painted his face white to play these parts, but he would never paint his hands white because he wanted to stay <laughs> as he was. He didn't want to get lost in the part. See? <laughs> see, he was so good that he'd make the actresses jump up off the table when he comes storming out to get Desdemona. You know, she said, he, that's a, he's going to really get me. So people like to play with Ira Aldrich. This woman was responsible for the fashion in Europe called the bustle. And Freud must have been right. If one, one human being has something that another human being doesn't have, then that one that doesn't have envies it. He called it penis envy in psychology. He didn't take notice of buttocks envy. <laughs> Even though all over Europe people felt insecure about the absence of behind and develop a style called the bustle. <laughs> So don't cover it up anymore now. <laughs> Take pride in what you have. <laughs> now, we've been in East Africa, but East Africa and West Africa are the same thing. In other words, people want to say, well, black people in America came from West Africa. What you doing over there in Egypt and Ethiopia and all of that? Well, all you have to do is do a little looking and you'll find out the migration explains the establishment of West Africa. For example, the Mali people, are really uh, Malinka people, and Malinka is genetically kin to Coptic in language and culture is the same all over. So these are, all you're talking about is Africans that came from the, the Nile Valley at different times and spread out all over the continent like they did all over the world. And here's an example of that, 1310. This is 100 years before Columbus, brother sitting up in Mali, Mansa Musa, King Musa with a little gold nugget tempting this Arab trader. So in other words, they had a regular gold trade coming to Mali and to Timbuktu a hundred years before Columbus. These little savages had that. They also had a little university up there with a nice little president named President Ahmed Baba who did a lot of book writing, wrote about 40 books. 20 of those books are on file right now in Morocco in the library. Morocco, the Moors again, the black people of Africa. Okay, Morocco... Uh, and below that, Timbuktu, is the heart of Mali, Songhai, and Ghana. Okay, these are three separate African empires. The reason I want to show you this is that the man who you saw on the throne a minute ago had a brother named Abu Bakari. And his brother left on an expedition exploring the Atlantic in ships. Remember, Columbus, when he gets ready to sail a hundred years later, comes to Africa to get his navigator. He has an African navigator. You know, they just say pilot. You don't have a pilot. You have a pilot in the harbor. This is a navigator for the ocean. Because people who navigated the Sahara did so by starlight and sunshine, and by shooting the stars, you navigate the same way on the ocean. But the reason I'm putting this here is that American history was supposed to have been rescued by Alex Haley. And I guess they're still going to do it. He and Norman Lear worked up some kind of partnership. And they're supposed to be fixing our history. Now, Kunta Kinte never would have gotten captured if he hadn't been a high school dropout. See, he's out there chopping wood way out here on the ocean when he should have been back up in Timbuktu going to school. That's where the university was. That's why he got captured. Now, why do you want to start African history with Kunta Kinte? Don't name your child Kunta Kinte. <laughs> name him Ahmed Baba, Abu Bakari. Mansa Musu, but not Kunta Kente. He couldn't even escape well. <laughs> Lost his foot. That's what happened when you don't read to back up what's happening. You know, you ought to ask yourself a question. Why did they give us seven nights on TV, prime time? You know, not to tell the truth, because that's not the truth. What you saw is not the truth on Roots. You know? Check it out. All the stuff I've been telling you, none of this is in roots. Now, if you want roots, go to the tap roots. These are the deep roots. Let's get it straight. Sundiata. Where were the people talking about Sundiata? Name your child Sundiata, the king of Mali. Read the history of the Yorubas. They say they came from Egypt. These books already exist. Don't call this the Moor of Dresden. Call him by his name, Shango. Name your child Shango, the Nigerian god of thunder and lightning. 
If you want some religion, read what Africans think about religion. Read what the Dogon people still think about religion and why they impress anthropologists so much. Read conversations with Ogotemele. Read the travelers and what they had to say about Africa. This is Ibn Battuta's travel. Notice the date of the book is 1325. In other words, this book was circulated in Europe. Why after this book was circulated in Europe would European historians write about Africans and say they're swinging by their tail from trees when they knew better? Think about it. This is before Columbus sailed the ocean blue. If you want the answer to that, read The Destruction of Black Civilization, Chancellor Williams, Howard University. If you want the answer to that, read Walter Rodney's book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, and also how black people in America were still being underdeveloped. Or read the documents in, e in England, the Africa Association, where people sat down and planned how they were going to get the gold out of Mali. Read the first-hand documents of people who are calculating and see how it happened that we lost. Read Christianity, Islam, and the Negro to see what those religions did to Africa. Written by a black man in 1887, Edward Wilmot Blyden. Name your child Blyden, not Kunta Kinte. Read about Shaka. Name your child Shaka. Okay. Not Fiddler. <laughs> See, why is it you can't make a movie about Shaka? Why in all the history of movie making has this man not been an interesting figure? The one who held back colonization and had one of the finest ar armies that Africa has ever produced. And finally, African Americans. And I just say African-American. I could be talking about African-Chinese. There's some up there. African-Russians. There's some up there. African-South Americans. Africans in Guam. Africans in the Philippines. The oldest Filipinos are called Negrillos or Negritos. Nobody ever took them down out of the hills yet. They're still up there holding out for the good times. Maybe you'll join them. <laughs> Africans got here before Columbus. That's before slavery. Africans were here and carved big old heads, just like they did in Egypt. You saw the Sphinx, well the brothers still insisted on carving. You know how we like to have pictures taken. So Ivan Van Sertima wrote a book. Now his book was published, but it didn't get a lot of play. Matter of fact, the company that published his book never advertised it really. And uh, it almost always are out of stock. But I think you'll want to read what's in this book because there's documents in the book. He's documenting it here. Here's the Olmec head. You call him Olmec, I call him Egyptian. Egyptian heads or African heads down in Mexico. Take a trip down there this summer. You can go down, even with gas, the price that it is. You'll see these old Mac heads down in Mexico. Look at the brother, got an African hairdo. Got his afro carved in the stone. Now, when Van Dyneken sees it, you get denial of reality. He writes his book, Chariot of the God. He says, these are people who came to America from outer space. <laughs> he says, they're wearing space helmets. You can see, according to Van Dyneken, they call this one Joe Lewis, so they look like Joe Lewis in outer space. <laughs> Another brother from outer space. The funny thing about it is you get a good scholar like, like uh, Van Sertima, and what Van Sertima does is document the fact that in the 25th dynasty, this is the way people dress for war. That the Egyptians of the black 25th dynasty, I showed you Teharqua and I showed you uh, uh, Shabaka, those two pharaohs of the 25th dynasty showed you they were black. And the helmets that are worn by their soldiers are leather helmets that have the same design on them that the Olmec heads in Mexico have on them. And recently Clyde Winters translated the script for the uh, Olmec and it turns out that he uses Malenka language or Malenka Bambara language and the script is a Manding script which derives from Ethiopia if you want data, you know, if you don't want testimony. Okay, here in the final piece I'll show you of uh, the connection. The two ceremonies, the one in the upper left is from Egypt, the one in the lower right is from Mexico. The upper left, King Tut, the mummy is dead. His uncle who offed him, Uncle I, is performing a ceremony with a little stick called opening the mouth of the mummy, which the king does after the other king is dead. And then they have this little symbol there, which is, the king is dead, long live the king. You thought that was British, didn't you? That's in Egypt, long time before there was a Britain. But then here's the same ceremony in Mexico. King doing the opening of the mouth of the former king, the mummy. Notice both kings have a leopard skin coat with a leopard skin tail hanging down between their legs. 
Okay, the old Mac heads are sitting on wooden platforms that are uh, carbon dated to 900 years before Christ. The 25th dynasty in Egypt is 900 years before Christ. Don't ask anybody to interpret anything for you. Get first-hand data. This is the script that they wrote in. On the old Mac is the left, and on the right is the Mandane script. You see they are exactly the same script. African script and Mexican script. Uh, in the Library of Alexandria were maps. And this is a French admirable who put together pieces of the map. This is in Van Sertima's book showing that the Egyptians knew the relationship of Africa to South America, correct longitude and latitude. Africa's gift to America told us about this. This was that same old Pullman porter again who fortunately didn't get trained, just got educated. Uh, so forth with Harvard, uh, Harvard linguist. This is Leo Weiner who at Harvard University in 1920 wrote a book called Africa and the Discovery of America. Three volumes. You can get that in your library, but I'll bet nobody has read it and checked it out lately. In other words, since 1920, the documentation of the contact, for example, this man was the one to show that uh, the West Africans have a word for gold called guanam. The Indians, guess what they call their gold? Guanam, which they say they got from dark, tall, black people to the south who had been found by uh, Balboa when he got over in Panama. When Balboa got there, he saw Africans there. As a matter of fact, Africans ran across this ocean so much they call it the Ethiopian Ocean in 1625. But somebody changed it to the Atlantic Ocean. Unexpected faces in ancient America before Columbus, who were they? These Mandingo people who left from Abu Bukhari's land in Mali who made it over here and established civilizations all along the coast of South America. Africans were here when Columbus got here because the currents that leave Africa are currents that will take ships to South America and the West Indies and did that because black people were there before Columbus got there. Barry Fell from Harvard University wrote a book called America BC in which he documents the fact that African hieroglyphics are found all over America including Davenport, Iowa and this is an example of them. On the left, you see hieroglyphics from Egypt. On the right, you see hieroglyphics from Davenport, Iowa, from things they've discovered there. The Hawaiian Islands were populated first by people who came from Africa. Here's Kamehameha. Here's Kamehameha's royal family. These are the women of early Hawaii. Now, just because you go to Hawaii now don't see people looking like this, and charred doesn't mean that they weren't there in the beginning. They just happened to have been wiped out. These are the Hawaiians in the beginning. These are in, I got these pictures out of the Bishop's Museum in Hawaii. You can go over there and get the same pictures if you want. We may not want her, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, we accept them all. <laughs> these are some of the people who still sail the Pacific Island without maps and without compasses because of their outstanding study of stars, outstanding study of the currents and wave patterns, swell patterns, outstanding study of the birds, outstanding study of the fish and their habits. They navigate by following fish, sometimes luminous fish, navigate in all kinds of ways without map or compass. So here comes Captain Cook watching these men sail and can't figure out how they got where they're going. So he assumed they were accidentally on the island. And people, even though he had ships that were bigger than his ship, his ship, the Endeavor, was 106 feet long. He met ships 110 feet long with better sailors, faster sailors, and still these people are primitives. Yeah, they're the first. National Geographic conducted an expedition with these men demonstrating that sailing knowledge, demonstrating their academic teaching knowledge. This is a, um, a map, of, map of waves and swells, a way to demonstrate that in navigational school. This is a map of the Pacific Islands of Guam and Saipan, and Truk, Kwajalein, and that whole area out there. This is an actual map that was used for navigation. Each one of those shells represents one of the islands in the chain. And then the stick represent wave and swell patterns. And this is a general model, which Jensen says we can't have, which is the general case of the interaction of any swell and any wave on any combination of islands. That's what we call abstract thinking. But uh, some people who look at abstract thinking are so incompetent to look at it uh, that uh, they demonstrate their own inability to think, I think, tunnel vision. These are the ways Africans got around the world and read boats and Thorough Heidel went around and proved that it could happen by sailing from Africa to America. 
Africans were all over the world, in Portugal, in Spain. Africans were in China. Africans are in Morocco. The Na uh, the Naki people in China, for example, are still there today. They've been there since before history. The Adaman Islanders show that African peoples, we call pygmies, got up and got all over the world. We don't know how or why they got there, but we find them there. Africans in Morocco. Africans in Mexico, part of the Indians. They have names that reflect the fact that they came from Africa. Even Africans in California, such as our first governor, P.O. Pico for whom Pico Boulevard in Los Angeles is named. Very first governor of the state of California. Merv Diamond Lee will never make it as the first governor. Presidents of America that were African Americans, such as Harding with his maternal uncle shown right under his neck there. And you want to know who the other presidents were? Come next week. We will tell all. <laughs> There's even a new president that may have been African American that we're not going to talk about. But all the cartoonists know who I'm talking about. <laughs> and Jim Beckworth, uh, African American who, uh, for whom a pass is named. But I want to show you that the LA Times is still busy. And here is uh, Jim Beckworth, uh, artist conception. And here's Jim Beckworth, camera conception. If the artist draw him, you get perceptual distortion and denial of reality. The camera draws him, you get reality as it is. You begin to see why we have to ask certain questions. Some of the churches said that we didn't have a soul for a while, uh, and then we couldn't even get into the priesthood, but they were late. This is Elijah Abel, who was a friend of Joe Smith and Brigham Young, who helped found Salt Lake City, Utah, and was a member of the Council of 70 Elders of the Mormon Church. He was right there in the beginning. So you have to tell people, they were too late to shut the door because one already got in right in the beginning. Elijah Abel. Race is a concept that was invented largely in the 17th century to divide people. We recognize physical differences among people. Race is something we don't understand, at least not in any scientific sense. The concept of race that we've been taught has made us make foolish and disturbing errors of science, such as this. National Geographic magazine. The Ethiopians have pronounced Semitic features, kinky hair, thick lips, but otherwise not Negroid. So if uh, you can follow that twisted logic, then you find that you're looking at white people, not black people. See, they have kinky hair and thick lips and they're black, but they're not Negroes. You got it? Okay, you notice the one in the center has that same old abnormal head that the Egyptians always have. This is a woman from Rwanda and uh, she's got that little thing around her head. These are some other Africans who are not Negroes. You know, none of these people are Negroes because for some reason or other people have decided that the culture that they produce had to be a non-African culture, had to be a culture that someone else produced. They had to have had a genetic derivation from somewhere else. So none of those are blacks. Okay, now your final exam, in order to conclude this presentation, I'm going to give you final exam here, a little four-item four item multiple choice question because you've been such a good audience. And I think you ought to be able to pass this by now. Which one is the black? <laughs> <laughs> you see, in the top, that's a Filipino, so she's white, not black, see? In the upper right, that's Australian, so she's white, bushwoman. And the one on the left is Ethiopian, so she's white, see? Semitic. And the one in the lower right is black, though, because she's American. You got it? <laughs> okay, once more now. Said so we're going to give you five chances. Which one is the black? That's right. That's right. That's right. The only black one up there is the one in the lower right. You got him. Well, you've been good because you've been to school and uh, you've learned all those lessons that people have tried to teach us. Uh, the way that they've tried to teach us with a liberal education to be an imitation, but not creative scholars and not creative thinkers. And that we can be creative scholars without doctorates, masters, bachelor's degrees, because that doesn't guarantee anything. Matter of fact, if anything, probably guarantees you're going to have a harder time doing some of those things. Like Irving, in no way am I suggesting that we don't go for these things, because we must. But at the same time, we have to do that, maintaining all the freedom that is possible for us to maintain by being conscious. P. 
people have been trying to tell us these things for a long time. This isn't the first time that someone has said these things to you. Du Bois said it in Black Reconstruction when he told you about the fact that slaves invented America's public school system. There was no intent in the Constitution and no support for public education until blacks demanded it after having been freed in the South. So you go to a public school system that later blacks were kicked out of after they had created them. Du Bois told us about the part that Africa played in world history. These books have been around, but why is it that they are not on your book list? Marcus Garvey wrote books as well. Always try to make Marcus Garvey out to be a clown. You see, they take clowns and then make them into heroes, and then take heroes and turn them into clowns. So every, every time you see Marcus Garvey, you see him in his uniform. Uh, but no one asks you to see what Marcus said. You know, well, this is one of the things that happens with Malcolm the same way. You'll, you'll probably get the autobiography of Malcolm before you'll get uh, by any means necessary. Uh, you'll probably get uh, something telling about how he stuck his head in the toilet to keep his conch from burning his head, but you won't get Malcolm's book on African American history. And so certainly you won't see what Marcus wrote, so you won't know whether you, you can believe what's been said about him or not. You probably will not be told, even though the books exist, that black people have always established independent centers of living in order to draw, uh, to build a kind of society that would support their forays into sometimes a hostile world. And so some of these societies still exist in the South and in South America. There are people who live there now called Maroons. As a matter of fact, Marcus Garvey is the descendant of Maroons. And because they love freedom more than slavery, they chose ways to defend themselves and extend their society, and it still lasts. And certainly it lasts in the hearts and minds of many black people. Malcolm X wrote on African American history, and not simply the book that you read, uh, the uh, autobiography of Malcolm, which wasn't even written by Malcolm. It was written by Alex Haley. Carter Woodson was writing about African heroes and heroines, and the date you'll notice is 1939. In other words, we had a comb. David Walker was calling us a long time ago and addressed to the slaves of the United States of America. He, and he called us slaves, but what he meant was mental slavery. He said, well, you don't have a comb and you ought to get a comb. So I'm showing you all the combs that have been here for all that time. So our question is, what is it that happens in our education that causes us to believe that we don't have combs and that we don't have the intellectual combs that will get our intellectual hair straight? Paul Robeson tried to write about what he felt and was uh, rejected for it, this book went out of print. Almost all of these books are not things that you will find in the normal course of the day. So I would like to conclude the lecture by referring to this quote from Malcolm X. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a reception next door downstairs in the mezzanine.